despite what watching too much mainstream news may lead you to believe. If you look around the globe, a lot of nations, although certainly not the majority, have managed to create thriving modern societies where most of their citizens aren't doing too bad. They're at least doing quite a bit better than most of humankind was doing as recently as 100 years ago and doing way better than we all were 1,000 plus years ago. Most of the world's people have longer lifespans than we did just a few decades prior. Most of us enjoy heightened individual liberties and a laundry list of modern amenities that would make any king just two centuries back get pretty damn jealous. Maybe make him want to throw his little king hat down in disgust. I'd bet any ancient pharaoh would happily trade his pyramid or the relative he's probably having sex with, as many of those incestuous pharaohs did, for a microwave pizza and some Netflix. And out of all the cultures currently crushing the past on the standard of living scale, there is one cold and wet part of the earth that seems to somehow always be among the leaders of the pack, Scandinavia, land of the Vikings. When it comes to equality of opportunity, education, basic human happiness, and even economic freedom, Scandinavian nations seem to lead the rest of the world. Today, the citizens of Denmark, Sweden, and Norway are considered among the kindest societies, the most fair, and the happiest people in the world. Why? uh, These are, are the descendants of who we call the Vikings, history's most infamous rapers and pillagers. Norse societies that populated Northern Europe weren't exactly known for their gentle touch. History often refers to Vikings as dirty, bloodthirsty man animals that left their weak babies for dead and raped and pillaged the shit out of any land they found people alive on. And some of that reputation is earned. Some. The Vikings were raiders, and they did revel in battle. They did take slaves, and there was a lot of violence. But there are also, uh, you know, they're a culture mired in myth. How much of the popular understanding of Viking history is actually true? And how much of their history has been written by their enemies and their victims? There are so many interesting aspects to the Vikings and their culture. We've touched on the spiritual beliefs of the Vikings with the Norse gods in the past, back in Suck 77. Today, we dig into their actual lives. The Vikings are much more complicated than the brutal sociopaths they've been uh, often remembered as. A rich culture with its own languages, religion, mythology, and customs, the Vikings continue to be a popular topic of discussion nearly a thousand years after their decline. Most of uh, what we know about the ancient Nordic people come from sagas and semi-historical writings written about them centuries after the fact. Like the mythology of all cultures, uh, cultures, many of these sagas trade historical accuracy for mythos and hyperbole. But we're still able, based on the writings of a few ancient historians and archaeological evidence, to come to what we think is a pretty decent understanding of Viking life. On this episode of The Suck, we are going to find out how the descendants of Viking warriors transitioned from international pirates and slavers and to some of the world's most, uh, uh, you know, advanced and egalitarian nations. And we're going to have fun doing it. We will dispel many myths, and I think we'll find a more nuanced appreciation for these wild marauding meat sacks of the North. Work can wait. It's time for Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Time Suckers. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. Get ready to learn and have fun while doing it. I'm Dan Cummins. He of oh so many nicknames uh, that suck. And you are listening to Time Suck and have a big announcement today. On April 29th at noon Pacific time, we're going to start selling tickets to The Gathering, a Time Suck social event that will take place right here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, where you can see the Suck Dungeon, meet other Time Suckers and Space Lizards, hang in the heart of Sucktum, Really hoping to make this an annual event and grow it every year. I want to build the social aspect of what we're doing here. And Queen of the Suck, Lindsay, has been working with intern Derek Hall from Keene University to make this happen this year. Uh, We're selling tickets for $125 a piece, and you cannot use your Space Lizard discount code for this. Uh, We're only selling 55 tickets total. Uh, we're We're just not ready to organize an event bigger than that quite yet. Uh, and here are the specifics of what you get for that $125. You get to, uh, to to go to Time Suck the Gathering, Saturday, August 17th, 2019. That's Saturday, August 17th, 2019. Odds are the weather will be beautiful here in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, you get a personal uh, tour of the Suck Dungeon. Uh, I'll, I'll be taking you on that in small groups. You get a private dinner at the uh, Time Sucker Ran 10 over 6, where they will have a Time Sucker themed private menu. The whole restaurant will be ours for food, drinks, and community. Uh, We're selling the tickets first come, first serve. Each person may only buy two tickets, so no one can monopolize the event. 
Everyone has access to the sale at the same time to keep it fair. And it's going to be a full day event. Uh, to buy tickets, you just go to the Time Suck Merch Shopify website page there. Uh, select the Gathering tab on our Shopify store. Make sure you read all the directions and include your shirt size and mailing address and your preferred tour time uh, for the Suck Dungeon Tour. You'll receive your official ticket in the mail at least two weeks before the event. Uh, the cost of the ticket will get you a 30-minute uh, tour You know, in, in a little small group with me. Check out the uh, Suck Dungeon. Check out the new studio uh, that we, we were just um, going to be building. We'll just have built by the time you come out. Um, I'll be, uh, yeah, again, I'll be hosting that. Tours will start uh, at 10.30 a.m., run until 4 p.m., and then the 7 p.m. Uh, private Time Suck themed dinner will start at 10 over 6. And uh, you're only granted access to that if you possess a ticket. In, in addition to the surprise menu of food and drink, there will be a photo booth, giveaways, chance to mingle with your Time Suck family and the Time Suck crew. And the dinner includes uh, all you can eat food and two drinks. And then there's a cash bar for the duration of the evening if you want to just get fucking nuts. Oh, yeah, I hear Paisley yelling in the back there. Uh, Hail fucking Nimrod. I'm pumped for this. I'm very pumped. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Uh, Okay, Time Suck is brought to you today by the Life Gets Hairy podcast. Hosted by Ryan Lane, Time Sucker, Space Lizard, Man with a Golden Beard, the brain behind Dream Beard, the beard care product company that I love and tell all my friends about. Ryan was a Christian pastor for 10 years, then he left to expand his faith I met him in Atlanta a while back. Great dude. Uh, respects the beliefs or lack thereof of all kind-hearted meat sacks. He's now an entrepreneur selling products in 100 countries after founding Dream Beard uh, with only $46. And he has a fun podcast. It kicks off with different intros. He makes himself with his musical abilities. He loves diving into the perceptions of his uh, guests to understand reality through uh, their eyes. Life Gets Harry is all about, uh, you know, different stories told by all different kinds of people. Normal people, famous people, artists, psychedelic, uh, therapists, musicians, toy makers, CEOs, just to name a few. Uh, people who give us a, a wider gaze of this world. We all have to go through shit, and hopefully listening to others helps us realize that suffering is universal and we can get through it. A lot of laughs, deep shit, fascinating stories, so head to iTunes and listen and subscribe to Life Gets Harry. You can also go to www.lifegetsharry.com or just go to lifegetsharry.com. Yeah, the old man me still wants to throw those W's there. Uh, thanks again to our Patreon supporting Space Lizards for allowing us to donate $2,000 to one of the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation Stair Climbs. Link in the episode description. Click donate, then donate to an individual, then type in the name Cameron Owens. Make sure that this uh, time sucker gets credit for doing something great. Hail Nimrod. Couple quick tour dates, then off to Vikings. Uh, Texas Theater in Dallas, where uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was captured after uh, his involvement in the JFK assassination. I'm going to be there on uh, April 26th. The Secret Group in Houston on the 27th. Late Show has been added in Houston. Punchline in San Francisco, May 1st through the 4th. Live Ant Hill Kids Suck on Saturday the 4th. Looking like that show is going to sell out uh, before the event. May 9th uh, through the 11th, I'll be at Laugh Boston in Boston, Massachusetts, Spokane, Jacksonville, and more coming up quick. Ticket uh, info for the entire 2019 Happy Murder stand-up tour is at dancummins.tv. And now, let's rape and pillage some Viking history. Okay, let's start with the why. Why did anyone settle in Scandinavia in the first place? Had they, had they never been to the warm beaches of Greece? Did someone trick people into heading that far north before the invention of portable electric heaters? Uh, around 4000 BCE, after a nomadic band of early Indo-European uh, humans had long since moved away from the lush savannas of Africa to more, shall we say, challenging northern climates, a small group of what I can only assume were masochists decided to head super, super north. The ancestors of the Vikings. Far enough north to find that part of the earth that hurts your lungs and freezes your nose hairs every time you breathe. Far enough to essentially have to wear a series of blankets whenever you head outside or risk losing your fingers or, or toes or even your life to frostbite. Why did they do it? Why did they do it? And before I shit all over this decision, let it be known that I, that I personally have some Viking blood. Love Scandinavians. My great-grandfather on my mom's side, a man named John Berman. I was lucky enough to spend a lot of time with uh, great-grandpa John as a child. Both my great-grandparents on my mom's side were alive and healthy until I was in high school. Uh, Grandpa John was born and raised in Sweden, from Stockholm. 
Uh, his wife, my great grandma Estelle, was first generation Norwegian American. Both of her parents born and raised in somewhere in Norway. I should probably find out. Uh, they both spoke their native languages, which are very similar. Not the same language, but they understood each other. Their daughter, my grandma Betty, didn't speak either Swedish or Norwegian, but did understand both languages. And I don't fucking understand uh, why their ancestors and mine chose to settle where they did. Cold ass Scandinavia. I know Sweden, Norway, Denmark, other Scandinavian, you know, areas like, like Finland are, are great places to live now, but only because we have modern uh, amenities to substantially ease the burden of a long, punishing, unforgiving, brutal winter. But before hot tubs, flat screen TVs, high speed Wi Fi, coffee shops, Mm, no, thank you. I read an interesting article about humanity's early uh, northern migration. Nothing specific to Scandinavia, just about uh, why humans moved north in the first place. Why they would ever uh, move to a place where you could literally freeze off your balls or your, or your tits in the winter. And a paleoanthropologist, Martha Tappan, said, At the higher latitudes, you're confronting seasonality for the first time. Ancient humans were experiencing winter. Right? Like for the first time, no other primate lives where there's no fruit in winter. Right? Those, they were the first people to live where there's no fruit in winter. I love that line. No other primate lives where there's no fucking fruit in the winter. Exactly. That's a sign not supposed to be there. Every time I go to a tropical climate, I just think, why could my ancestors have settled here? This place is the fucking best. While some of my uh, pre-Viking ancestors were huddled around a fire wearing caribou hides and gnawing on some dry, nasty-ass old salt to strip wolf meat, or maybe scrubbing some mold off some shitty-ass root vegetable that tastes like the dirt it just got pulled out of, there were other ancient people chilling out on a Caribbean beach, pulling a delicious ass red snapper out of some warm, crystal clear sea, washing it down with sweet coconut water, right? Coconuts, nature's cups, uh, snacking on a ripe, delicious mango. God. Ah. So really, like, why did humans ever uh, choose to live in northern climates when the world is full of so many warm weather places? The truth is, nobody knows for certain. Probably because too many humans just weren't content living in someone else's kingdom, following someone else's rules. So they moved away uh, to create their own little kingdom, make others live by their rules. And then some of those people got tired of listening to them and following those rules. And they moved. And that happened again and again and again. And then still others decided that they did like their group's rules and felt like more of the world should live like they did. And they expanded to spread their culture. And then the further they would expand, you know, the further they got from those tasty ass mangoes and their fucking red snappers. Tropical beaches. Also, a lot of the science community thinks that the uh, climate changes that happened between 55,000 and 70,000 years ago also began pushing early humans out of the warm places. Africa uh, went from being very wet to very dry. And with that change came the loss of a lot of food and drinking water, which pushed people north to try to, you know, not die. Uh, then as they slowly moved north, they slowly developed the ability to create the right tools and wear the right clothes to survive. The winter were highly adaptable creatures. They acclimated. And eventually, people, pre-Viking people, developed the ability to live through the winter in a place like Uppsala, Sweden, roughly 70 kilometers, 43 miles north of Stockholm, uh, not even close to the most north northern, uh, or not even close to the most northernest, northernmost, god damn it, so many most there, uh, most, no, most northernmost, it's, 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 it's a long ways from the fucking top of Sweden is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but this place still has an average December daily high of 30 degrees Fahrenheit negative one Celsius, an average low of 23 degrees Fahrenheit, negative five degrees Celsius, a city with a, a record low, not counting wind chill of roughly negative 40 degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit, the way those kind of come together there in the negatives, uh, a, a place where the sun sets at roughly 2.45 p.m. in December, right after lunch, sunsets. Uh, meanwhile, still peeps living on fish and fruit, laying on toasty, breezy beaches where the sun sets at 6 p.m. in December, where the temperature hovers around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. 27 degrees Celsius down there, in, uh, you know, uh, like the someplace like Panama. The standard of living may be higher in Scandinavia than Central America, but the weather just isn't better. But if the Vikings uh, would have lived on a nice sandy beach where it was a little easier to stay alive, you know, maybe they wouldn't they wouldn't have ever donned their their sweet horned helmets or hopped in boats or fucked up uh, other people with axes and warhammers, and then we wouldn't have an interesting uh, subject to talk about today. So thanks for freezing, Vikings. Uh, there's so many interesting things to look at with Viking culture, and we will look at so much. Just know that uh, a lot of the timeline we're going to get into um, is hazy, and much of what we think we know uh, was written about, uh, you know, way after the fact, and, and a lot of it is still highly debated. Uh, the Viking era existed roughly from between uh, about 750 CE to 1066 CE. 
Uh, it, it actually officially began with most historians in 793 CE when the Vikings attacked England. But, you know, again, that's just like when the, when the Vikings were introduced to uh, England and kind of other parts of Europe. They could have been, you know, uh, living as they as they were when they came to England for, you know, quite a while before that. And they didn't just suddenly stop being Vikings at 1066 CE. But that defines the Viking era. Relatively short, approximately 300 year run, but it left quite a mark on cultures as far east as Russia, as far south as Turkey, as far west as North America, based on archaeological evidence. Uh, and just like I alluded to, many of the myths that surround this mysterious group of people can, uh, come from the victims of the Vikings' rape and pillage campaigns and from accounts written hundreds of years after those events. And a lot of the accounts we have of the Vikings come from uh, uh, members of, or at least followers of, the Catholic Church, and they didn't care for the Vikings. They didn't care for these non-Christian pagans, and they painted the Vikings as wild, dirty, smelly subhumans. Uh, they weren't that bad. Uh, it's not like they were Polish people. And uh, and love Polish people, by the way. If you're a new listener, I just love to tease them. Uh, part of the Catholic hatred of Vikings is actually entirely understandable. It wasn't just because they were they were you know pagan, quote unquote. Viking raiders would often attack uh, Christian churches first in raids, knowing that they would both be undefended and also full of the town's riches. Uh, the church did not appreciate that. They didn't find that to be very amicable. And the Vikings didn't care what the Catholics thought because they didn't believe in their God, which pissed them off that much more. Uh, kind of a dick move on the Vikings part to attack churches, but also kind of a dumb move by the Catholics you know, to keep their wealth in, in undefended places with, uh, when they knew that big dudes with axes were, were heading their way. Uh, basically, the Vikings got worse press than uh, most other warring and conquering peoples of their era because, again, A, they weren't Christian, uh, at least not initially. B, uh, they attacked Christian churches, and then those churches owned the printing presses, uh, and then they would, those people would go on to write shitty things about them. Hard, hard to get good press when you're attacking uh, the publishing houses. Not going to get a good review for something when you've just beat up the journalist writing the article and burned down his office and most likely his house as well, right? You're going to get a lot of uh, press like, fuck those savage heathens. May God punish their wicked church burning ways. Why do they wear their horned helmets? Why to please their master Satan, of course. Vikings are the worst. So let's start by erasing a bit of propaganda about the Vikings and dispel at least one myth about them right away. While it was fair for the church to call the Vikings brutal and wild, especially the berserkers, who we'll talk about more here soon, not fair to call them uh, dirty and smelly, which was uh, some, some stories spread around uh, medieval Europe about them. They may have been heathens, but they weren't dirty heathens. Um, the Vikings were reportedly known to bathe uh, around once a week, oftentimes in hot springs, and they were uh, you know, very aware of their outward uh, appearance and odors and, and took pride in their appearance and tried not to be stinky. And you might think like a, like a bath once a week in a hot spring. That doesn't sound very clean, actually. You know, if I took a bath uh, once a week in a hot spring, my coworkers wouldn't think, have you met Clean Jerry? Man, no one's cleaner than Clean Jerry. He must be hitting the hot spring at least once a week. He smells springy great. No, for some context, uh, Queen Elizabeth I is said to have only bathed once a month, and that was in the 16th century, centuries after the Viking era. I'm guessing common peasants weren't knocking out baths more often uh, than that on average from the 8th through 11th centuries. So bathing back then, it was just hard to do. You know, how many baths you took, depending on if you lived in a town with a bunch of bathhouses or not, or if you lived near a hot spring, or if you could afford to have a private bath drawn for you and, uh, and didn't like being able to, to take a finger and scribble, dirty and I like it, in the cru uh, crud caked on your, on your ass cheek like dust on the back of an old unwashed van. Anyway, most historians seem to think the Vikings were actually more hygienic than most of their European counterparts. And it's actually possible that the Vikings helped clean up the rest of Northern Europe a bit. After burning down churches and cities across the coastlines and several continents, they may have uh, you know, left some of their grooming influence behind. Viking men uh, would often dye their hair, even their beards blonde, to conform to their own Nordic standards of beauty. Some reports say that they would brush their hair at least once a day, which if I'm going to be honest, that's more often than I comb my hair. Thank you, hats. Uh, and, and other cultures they uh, have encountered may have just emulated them a bit. Combs, razors, ear spoons, perfumes, electric hair dryers, crimping irons, all of that's been ex excavated from Viking uh, burials. Big crimpers. Uh, no, those last two are not true. But ear spoons is true. They had ear spoons. What is, a, what is a ear spoon, you ask? Well, it's a ceremonial spoon that Vikings used to eat a soup they made out of boiled human ears to prepare for battle. Uh, there's still a recipe you can find online. It's, uh, it's two onions, a handful of sea salt, uh, one cabbage, four carrots, and six pairs of Catholic baby ears. 
<laughs> no, it's a, it's a little metal spoon Vikings used to clean the wax out of their ears before the invention of Q-tips. Uh, no, thank you. Not going to put one of those in my ears. I would rather have dirty ear holes than to be trying to, to scoop out some wax with a little metal spoon. An ear spoon to me sounds like a good way to punch a hole in your eardrum uh, while you're rooting around in there with that, you know? Uh, also, am I, am I the only person who immediately thinks murder weapon? When I hear ears, the first thing that came to pop in my head, maybe I've just done too many true crime sucks. The first thing that popped up in my head when I heard about murder weapon was uh, I just started picturing someone cleaning their ear, right? Trying to scoop out that wax and someone else sneaks up behind them and then just fucking pow, pow, just slams their hand just poof, against the back of the spoon, pushes it all the way into the uh, poor person trying to have cleaner ears, just pushes it all the way into their head, right? Just the whole spoon, what? Right in the ear. Ugh. Why do I why do I immediately think shit like that all the time? Anyway, the Vikings by medieval standards, pretty damn clean. But how did they dress? Were they fly as fuck? Was it horn hats and fur vests and ripped abs and high-heeled leather boots like it is when you do a Google sc- uh, search for Viking costumes? Um, I love I love how, by the way, if you do a Google search, like a, like a Google image search for basically any type of costume at all. Within, I'd say, the first five to ten picks, you're usually just uh, into the majority of images being women sexually dressed, women scantily clad, right? Women in high heels. Hail Lucifina! But seriously, though, how much porn and pornish images can the internet hold? Out of curiosity, I actually typed uh, a Viking costume porn, just added porn to the end. <laughs> so much. So much. Uh, including women of ethnicities I'm pretty sure it didn't exist in Scandinavia uh, during the Viking age. Or, or maybe there were just a lot of sexy-ass Japanese Viking women uh, Women I just didn't know about. Uh, I joke, but I also, I also had to shut down those web results because I immediately started getting a boner as I was working here in the Suck Dungeon with uh, a couple other people also here in the office. Apparently, I am super into Asian Viking porn. Anyway. We think the clothing of the Vikings and Nordic peoples of the age was pretty simple, although our knowledge of their clothes is not complete nor agreed upon. Uh, few written records mention clothing. Archaeological records are, are, are a little bit limited. But that being said, most experts seem to agree that the men wore tunics, a thick, loose-fitting shirt basically worn over uh, loose trousers. Women wore one long dress, floor or ankle length, with an apron-style dress over it. The uh, apron dress hung from straps over the shoulders, fastened by two brooches in the front. Underneath these garments, uh, which were made from wool, both men and women wore linen undershirts or shifts, which they might have slept in. And then children wore the same styles as the adults. Uh, I've seen pictures, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that none of this shit is even remotely sexy. Uh, damn it, you know? Women did not wear heels or fishnets or even crotchless panties. Uh, it, you know, it, it's almost like uh, porn producers don't care about historical accuracy. Uh, Viking sheep provided the wool for clothes and Viking farms grew the flax from which linen is made. Viking women spent a lot of their time spinning and, and carding wool, weaving fabric, uh, making their family's clothes. How terrible is that, by the way? You know, especially for women. You had to make clothes instead of buying them. You know, if mom isn't real good with the needle, the whole family dresses like assholes. Uh, that's terrible. Mom, I'm sick of made, getting made fun of. Our tunics don't look right. They're not even. It's, a, it's supposed to be shaped like a rectangle, not this weird trapezoid parallelogram bullshit. Uh, also, you know that sewing skills probably tipped the scales in favor of some women when it came to marriage because it was super important. You know, just, look, son, I know she's not much of a looker. She's got what we call a strange shape and the breath smells like moldy salmon. But she makes a fine tunic. Think of the tunics, boy. As far as physical attraction, that shouldn't factor much in a marriage decision. Not for us Vikings, not for us Nordic folk. Look at my own wife. She she looks like a wolf made love with a reindeer instead of eating it. We live where it's cold and dark, son. A wife's face, a face of nightmares in my daughter's case, to be certain, doesn't end up being seen much anyway. Uh, Tunics were important. Viking warriors, farmers, and artisans required tunics to... uh, to have them fit well, you know, so they could live their lives and be productive. Uh, a Viking's kirtle, uh, kirtil, or over tunic, was cut from a complex pattern, and then the many pieces were stitched together to create a fitted garment where the arms and shoulders could move easily and freely. Uh, the tunic came down into a broad skirt that reached to the thighs or knees. A keyhole neckline made it easy to fit the uh, kirtil over the head. 
Most Viking men wore a simple braid trim on the neckline and around the cuffs of the sleeves. Uh, women wove the braid for the trim from brightly colored yarns. Uh, a Viking's wool trousers were held up by a belt or by a string passed through a loop. Uh, they were also warm and could be tucked into boots or left loose. Shoes for both sexes were simple and usually crafted from durable goat skin. <laughs> goat skin shoes. Don't see a lot of those anymore. At least I don't. Uh, looking for something after learning this detail, though, uh, did actually lead me to some badass looking goat uh, boots. Found some handsome ass goat boots over at a place called Joseph Cheney, Cheney, Joseph Cheney and Sons in the UK. I don't know, some store I'd never heard of. A uh, Lancaster military style ankle boot in copper goat skin with a leather sole, 329 pounds. I don't know if that's a good price for a goat skin boot, but I think it looks pretty dope. Might have to up my boot game. One of these days. I also found pics of some old replica Viking goat uh, skin uh, or Viking goat skin shoes. Do not think I'll be picking those up. The new boots looking quite a bit cooler than the old uh, shoes. Not not quite hipster enough to pull off uh, putting on some replicas. A uh, woman's overdress also had a keyhole neckline with long sleeves, fell to the ankle or floor. Over this, a Viking woman wore an apron dress with panels of fabric in front and back, held on the shoulders by straps which were fastened by two brooches known as turtle brooches because of their shape. Now, uh, these brooches could be made of bone, ivory, bronze, silver, or even gold for wealthier Viking women. A string of colorful glass, amber, and jet beads decorated the front of the apron dress hanging between the two brooches. Uh, no miniskirts, apparently. Uh, porn wrong again! Damn you, Safina! Uh, Vikings wore long, warm wool cloaks over their clothes for warm uh, warmth outside. Uh, hats were made of wool, leather, fur, woolen socks, kept the uh, feet warm under the shoes or boots. Leather belts pulled the outfits together. Nothing like a nice belt. Nothing, even in the Viking, in pre-Viking age, nothing like a nice belt to pull an outfit together. Uh, pouches, knives, other tools uh, hung off the belt uh, so they could be easily accessed. Uh, their clothes were dyed bright colors using vegetable-based dyes, creating a variety of colors from light browns to russets to red, yellow, gold, and blue. Wealthier Vikings could afford silk, uh, but this imported fabric was very rare in Viking culture and it's probably also how those sexy-ass Japanese Viking women got there, right? Just brought up some silk, and stayed around for the fishnets. Um, none of their clothes was supposed to be worn tightly. Tight clothing was seen as showy and pompous. All right, that's how you get mocked in the old Viking village. Oh, look at Leif over there in a super tight tunic. Hi, my name's Leif, and I'm so sexy in my tight little trousers and my sweat little goat shoes. I don't know why that guy talked that way. Uh, there are no... <laughs> I went in with no plan for a Swedish accent. I was like, let's fucking wing it. Uh, there's no surviving uh, Viking underpants, but they're believed to have existed. Uh, since none have been found, I'm going to pretend sexy Scandinavian women did wear some kind of wool G-string. Uh, Viking armor, simple as well. Sometimes completely non-existent, as you'll see with the uh, berserkers soon. Or berserkers. Uh, now let's talk about where these tunic-wearing bastards dwelled. Uh, Vikings lived almost exclusively in RV parks. Uh, airstreams, especially, were immensely popular. Uh, no, they lived in very sized homes uh, that didn't even have IKEA furniture back then. Vikings were a status hungry people, just like uh, people today. The poorest Vikings living in stables with cattle, right? That's how you know. That's how you know you get a fuck shitty Viking life. When you got some old ass goat shoes and, uh, you know, you got a fucked up tunic and you're just laying next to a cow out in a barn. I wish I would have married a better wife, making a better tunic, sleeping in a finer house. Um, Vikings, uh, but yeah, uh, Vikings didn't live in towns, but in small villages consisting of uh, usually only six or seven farms. Farms were usually fenced and near enough uh, each other to construct a common main road. In the center of most farms were the main houses, known as longhouses. Some of them were pretty nice, made primarily of wood. The long homes looked similar to Viking ships. Other buildings like workshops, stables, barns, and outbuildings were also built on the farms. The longhouse featured no windows or chimney, instead just a hole in the ceiling above the fireplace to let out the smoke. Uh, Viking architecture, especially in larger buildings, didn't get uh, much more advanced until later when ritual buildings morphed into churches uh, when Christianity arrived in Scandinavia during the Viking Age or Viking Era. Now let's look at the government. I think a good way to look into any culture is to examine their government, structure, and legal system. We're going to look into their war for, uh, war for, warfare soon, too, a promise. But let's take a peek at the societal structure first. Viking society was divided into four main levels. The highest level was the king, or uh, Kanungur, uh, who ruled the lands absolutely. Next were the earls, or jarls. Are you an earl, or are you a jarl? 
uh, Jarls ruled smaller petty kingdoms that would uh, often combine with other small kingdoms to build regional kingdoms. The third level is where the free Vikings were, and the farmers and blacksmiths were found on a third level called uh, the uh, Karls. Uh, the final fourth rung of the Viking society was the slave class, also known as the thralls. Uh, they had no power or freedom over their own lives and were occasionally sacrificed in horrific ways. The military was divided between two tiers, the highest one consisting of professional soldiers known as the Hirth and the amateur militia ranks called the Levi. Uh, the Vikings and the Nordic peoples uh, before them were primarily an oral culture and they shared their history by memorizing stories. Good old telephone game. That's what we're left with a lot of times when we're trying to understand various uh, early cultures. A good old story that's been passed down to a thousand people. Uh, the Vikings, they didn't just pass all of their info on orally, though. They did have their runes. Uh, runes were usually carved into stone, bone, or wood, and often saved for burial stones. The word rune translates into many languages as secret, whisper, mystery, intention, affectionate, love. Uh, there were 24 original letters that evolved to 33 after the Vikings invaded and mixed with the English. Uh, despite the lack of a widely used written language, the Nordic legal system and a basic understanding of Nordic law and government still existed. Free Viking men would gather into a group called a thing. Yep, not kidding, a, a thing. Each community had their own thing, capital T. Larger areas would have uh, higher things. <laughs> and for complex and big decisions, some countries like Iceland uh, had a national thing. Uh, their national thing was called the All Thing, and uh, Iceland's national parliament is still called uh, an All Thing. Uh, to help put an end to blood feuds and fatal duels, things were developed to issue fines, decide law, and even write new laws. Uh, each thing had its own law speaker, some poor bastard who had to memorize all the laws. Man, I would not do well at that job. It'd be a lot of like, yeah, that sounds right. And just a lot of like, let's listen, are you the fucking law speaker or am I? All right, you take a biscuit, you get punched in the eye is what I remember the law to being written and spoken as. So fucking bring your eye over here. Um, uh, it was a law speaker and the chieftain who would mostly decide on matters despite the other free men having a say. Powerful and large families and clans of united families often dominated Viking politics in this primitive form of democracy. Uh, when people were found guilty by the thing, I keep picturing the swamp thing. I keep saying it. When, when the, like this, like, you found guilty and then the swamp thing's like, ah, time for your punishment. Um, the second level was, uh, was being declared a semi-outlaw. So you could get a fine or you could be declared a semi-outlaw. Uh, and if you're a semi-outlaw, you got to get out of here for three years. You get exiled for three years. The third legal option was dreaded by most Vikings, and that was full banishment. Permanent exile. Get the fuck out. Exile meant no help from anyone, no protection under Viking law, and isolation. And, and being exiled, interestingly, uh, brings up uh, our next sponsor. Today's Time Suck is brought to you by Thor's Travel Agency, specializing in exiles. Thor's travel agency focuses on both long-term and also uh, even longer a uh, term, a.k.a. Uh, vacation permanent, uh, permanent vacations. Any old travel agency can get you a weekend deal, a uh, weekend deal somewhere, but exiles trust Thor when looking for a three-year plus or a do not fucking ever come back here or we'll literally kill you type of vacation. Right now, Thor's is uh, offering a $19 a night deal in any three-star or, or lower hotel in Angark, Siberia. Uh, or you can stay at, uh, you know, um, one of the two or three total hotels located in Greenland right now. As long as you book uh, for just $19, as long as you book a minimum of 1,095 nights in a row. You can also get your stay reduced to just $14.99 if you stay a minimum of 3,650 nights in a row. Plus, with every stay of at least 3,500 consecutive nights, you get a free complimentary breakfast on the weekend. And 25% off all items in the hotel pantry except chili cheese Fritos. And those tiny frozen sausage pieces guaranteed to burn all of the skin off the roof of your mouth. Guaranteed. All of it. Even if you wait five full minutes to take a bite after the microwave has done its devil's work. And of course, that's not today's sponsor. Uh, today's time suck is brought to you by Hymns. Uh, let's talk about Hymns. Uh, let's talk about, uh, you know, clammy hands. Not being fun. Uh, you know, to shake in an interview. Thankfully, with 4 the wellness brand for men uh, we trust here at TimeSuck, you can learn about options to treat the physical symptoms of performance anxiety, like a shaky voice, a uh, racing heartbeat, uh, sweats. Now, I'm lucky. I get nervous. Right? I get nervous every week. I'm going to butcher a lot of words, and then I just go ahead and I do it. Uh, I get nervous and anxious, but not enough, not enough to uh, not be able to uh, get on stage for stand-up comedy or show up to record the podcast. However, if I, if I did get that anxious, you can bet your sweet ass I'm going to get help. And if my doctor prescribes 
propranolol, I'm going to use it. Propranolol is a beta blocker that can help control the physical symptoms of anxiety taken before a stressful event. Propranolol can help ease the performance anxiety during that big event, like a, like a presentation at work or an interview. Beta blockers prevent adrenaline from making contact with your beta receptors, limiting your body's physical reactions to anxiety. These reactions can include a racing heartbeat, shaky voice or hands or sweating. Uh, by reducing some of these physical reactions, propranolol can help you feel much less anxious. Anxiety is real. It can hinder your social life and it can hurt your career. It can and does greatly diminish many people's uh, quality of life. And if you're one of these people, why just accept that? No, fight back. Fight the anxiety. Make the most of your earth time, meat sack. Uh, 4HIMS connects you to a doctor online who can evaluate you and if appropriate, prescribe your medication, uh, you know, the, the appropriate medication. They can help the physical symptoms of performance anxiety. And it can be delivered right to your door in discreet packaging. Don't let performance anxiety get in your way. Take action at 4 and Time Suckers get a special offer. You can get started for just $10 right now at 4 com slash Cummins, C-U-M-M-I-N-S. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash Cummins, C-U-M-M-M, oh, Jesus Christ, C-U-M-M-I-N-S. Uh, Whorehams.com slash Cummins. See website for full details and safe information. Uh, see? Uh, yeah, I can't even, can't even say my own name right on the show. Uh, link in the episode description. Button to the deal on the Time Suck Happen website. Oh, man. Too, too, I got to change my name, apparently. Uh, I got to change it to just, I don't know, the uh, less M's. Um, okay, now back up to, to wrap up Viking Law. That is, sorry, I know it's probably not that funny to you guys, but that is cracking me up. That uh, I struggle with other people's names here on the show. And I, I didn't know it. I struggle with spelling my own name. Okay. <laughs> Vikings had uh, uh, arbitration options, talking about Viking Law. Third parties were brought in the, to, to mitigate disputes. Sometimes fines and settlements can be made. Other times there could be duels called uh, holum gongs. Holum gongs uh, could be, uh, you know, uh, a fight to first blood or a fight to the death. Kind of like how uh, early Americans had pistol duels. These dudes had axe duels, which somehow sounds worse to me. I think, I think I'm think i going gun to gun if it's that or axe to axe. Mm-mm. Axe to axe. Fight, fight, fight. Axe to axe. <laughs> Creepy Requiem uh, 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 for a Dream scene re- reference here. Uh, regardless of the rulings and outcome, the, the thing meetings were held in a festive party kind of atmosphere. Ale and mead flowed. Vendors set up shop around the thing. The meetings lasted uh, for days. Sounds kind of fun. Sounds like a fun way to have court. Like a trial. Wish our trials were like that, right? Food trucks and t-shirt stands outside the courtroom. Right? Grab some tacos and a can you dig it tea outside of a you know Joaquin El Chapo Guzman trial. Uh, he's a dude, by the way, who escaped out of a Mexican prison via having a tunnel dug almost a mile long that led to his cell a few years ago. Kind of sucked that dude. So where does the, where does the word Viking come from? Uh, most historians, historians give the origin of the word Viking to the Old Norse. Uh, oh, boy. Uh, Aikin. 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 Uh, which is uh, uh, Viking for, for pirate raid. Um, it, it's, it's not a word the Norse used themselves, nor did they even identify uh, as a unified people, by the way. Uh, they were seen as a variety of different clans and tribes. Uh, there were even like Slavic and, and Irish Vikings. Viking, really more of a job title than a people when you get right down to it, more, more of a verb than a noun. Uh, we, we've just turned it into a catch-all phrase. Calling the ancient people of um, Vi- you know, or Scandinavia Vikings is similar to calling all of the people of like modern-day Nebraska corn farmers or calling all the people of San Bernardino, California porn farmers. Uh, man, what? One Google image search. I see those costumes, and now I just can't get porn out of my head. Uh, damn you, Internet. Be gone, Lucifina. Almost to today's little timeline now. Uh, Going to meet some legendary heroes. Learn about some mythical tales from Scandinavian uh, history soon. Crazy battles, fantastic sagas, ingenious inventions. Uh, these snow kings even figured out how to, how to set their piss on fire. Uh, Going to talk about that. Also, the, the, the Vikings were way ahead of even modern-day nations in many ways of life, including, uh, yeah, as we've discussed, you know, government, private property, uh, women's rights. They told great stories, made intricate art. Uh, perhaps they're best known besides the pillaging as being explorers. To Viking culture, their boats were as much a part of their lives as their farms and their axes. Uh, some brutality coming up, too, from a, from a crazy society of man animals called berserkers to tons of blood rituals, including a fun little work of art called the Blood Eagle. 
and of course the capturing, trading, and blood sacrificing of slaves. Uh, today's time sign, uh, timeline is a bit tricky. Most, again, of Norse history is hard to date and confirm, but we can do our best. Uh, Viking researchers and scholars continue to unearth new knowledge and reshape our understanding of these bearded, axe-wielding snow apes as you hear this. Now, let's get into some of the most important dates of the Viking era in today's Time Suck timeline before going into more specific details regarding interesting aspects of their culture after today's Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Sometime between 9,000 and 6,000 uh, BCE, the lands of Scandinavia began to be populated by mobile or, or semi-sedentary groups of whom little is known. By the 7th millennium BCE, uh, some of these early groups of humans began following the reindeer in northern Scandinavia, uh, basing their existence off these creatures, following them much like early American Indians lived off the buffalo. Uh, the early people living in the upper halves of present-day Sweden, Norway, even Finland, uh, followed salmon runs as well, moving south during the winters, moving north again during the summers. Early people on the coast also began to uh, live off seals and other coastal life as well. Long before there were Vikings, the ancient Nordic peoples uh, incorporated the thousands of miles of coastline into their daily lives. The ocean was their tool and their source of life. Uh, the many rivers and fjords uh, were, were their highways, and the plentiful fishing of the Atlantic helped create and maintain a number of coastal settlements. Uh, during the 5th millennium BCE, early pre-Vikings began to learn how to use pottery. They also began to cultivate the land and keep animals. Uh, by the 3rd millennium BCE, the, the beginnings of modern Scandinavian language took hold. Uh, they, had, they had a few meetings, and they decided to speak in a lilting, sing-songy language that's hard to take seriously. Uh, something that would be easy for the Muppets to later mock with their Swedish chef character, a bumbling, unintelligible idiot, whose depiction would surely be considered to be an offensive racial stereotype today if the chef was a member of, of almost any other race of people on Earth. But they get away with it with him being Swedish. It's dingy, bangy, fringy, tungy, meat boards and apron skivers, ringing bird, dingy, dungy, dingy. He couldn't sound dumber. Yundi, tungy, tungy, tungy. Uh, over the next few thousand years, uh, early Scandinavian cultures, uh, we just don't know a lot about, developed. Several petroglyphs uh, depict ships, indicating that uh, shipping played an important role in the culture. Uh, there are also numerous artifacts of bronze and gold and items suggesting early cultures traded, uh, and other items suggesting, excuse me, that uh, early cultures traded with other European cultures. Farming soon uh, became, became central to Nordic life, grow enough food to, to make it through the winter. Right, you got to figure that out if you're living way up north. Uh, barley, rye, oats, cabbage, onion, garlic, leeks, turnips, beans, peas, and more were grown by Vikings. They even had apple trees, raised cattle, sheep, goats, pigs, other livestock. Uh, most people alive during the Viking and pre-Viking times were, were farmers, not warriors or raiders. Uh, also, a lot of a lot of fishing being done. Ate a lot of fish over the next couple thousand years. These ancient people um, became skilled traders, craftsmen, and entrepreneurs. Uh, doubt those entrepreneurs opened up a lot of ice cream stands or shaved ice shops, but they did run businesses. And of course, it was the uh, centuries old tradition of boat building that made all of these seafaring people's activities possible. So now let's jump all the way uh, uh, ahead, ahead to the very end of the 8th century CE. On June 8th, 793 CE, the Viking era officially begins with a Viking raid on a monastery on the holy island of Lindisfarne. Uh, off the northeast coast of England, and it sent shockwaves through the Anglo-Saxon England and the Christian West. Part of the kingdom of uh, Northumbria at the time, this little area, a North, uh, Northumbrian scholar uh, serving in Charlemagne's court wrote of this event saying, the heathens poured out the blood of saints around the altar and trampled on the bodies of saints in the temple of God like dung in the street. The monks were killed or taken off as slaves while the treasures of the monastery were carried home in triumph. Never before has such an atrocity been seen, this scholar wrote. Uh, this actually is not the first Viking invasion into England. It's just the most noteworthy uh, early one. Uh, it's the one that really inspired terror, you know, killing monks. Going to piss off Catholics for sure. Uh, three Viking ships had actually raided the Isle of Portland on the Dorset coast and killed a local reeve or magistrate or official, you know, whatever, in 789 CE. Uh, Viking raids would continue to terrorize England for more than 200 years. Uh, precisely why the Vikings erupted out of their homelands in Scandinavia at this time is still a matter of debate. 
uh, rising population, poor harvests, improvements in shipbuilding, allowing long distance navigation, all possible causes. More likely, however, though, that uh, you know, once a few curious warriors raided their peaceful neighbors and then came home, you know, laden with a bunch of booty. Look, look at all this fucking treasure. Ah, we found a bunch of weird dudes with books and robes. Didn't even have swords. It's so easy just to fuck them up and take this stuff. This is great. You know, that probably encouraged, you know, other uh, others to want to, to get riches themselves and, and, you know, encourages more raids. Uh, Viking raids were, were simple, quick, and deadly campaigns, navigating their, their fast, long ships across the North Sea in perhaps as little as two days. The Vikings made use of their shallow draft to sail directly onto beaches or up inland rivers. Once ashore, the, the warriors would just quickly terrorize and pillage the local community, grab all their shit, possibly take quite a few of their people, uh, slaves, and then, and then just zip on back. Um, okay. Uh, Scandinavia now, present day, includes the nations of uh, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Uh, it can also include Finland, uh, Iceland, and several islands in the Atlantic, like Shetland, Orkney, the Faroe Islands, the uh, Hebrides. Um, Finland is probably the least Scandinavian of these places. Its language is not related to Swedish, Norwegian, or Danish. Uh, Finns are actually more Russian than Scandinavian culturally. Their, their language is part of the uh, uh, Ehrlich family of languages that includes Estonian and Hungarian. Uh, I actually remember asking my, my Swedish grandfather if he could understand Finnish people like he could Norwegian, and he, uh, he legitimately seemed insulted. He, he told me he'd rather be called uh, a child rapist than a, than a Finnish person. Then he grabbed me, he pushed my face onto an electric burner on the stove, and he turned it on. And, uh, and he said, uh, you know, if he was a Finnish person, he, he would just fucking leave my face there until the neighbor could smell my burning flesh. And then he let me go, and we didn't talk about anything for a while. Uh, no, that's insane. That's fucking insane. Uh, but my grandma Stella and grandpa John truly did not seem to care much for Finnish people in, in, in a way similar to what I've uh, noticed with some British people not seeming to care much for the French. I'm guessing times have changed a bit since my great grandparents days, but Swedes, Norwegians, Danes, a lot more in common with each other than they do with Finns. So anyway, Scandinavia is a bit of a loose term, more accurate to call these nations Nordic countries. Finland is a Nordic country, and by the early 9th century, many of these Nordic people began to leave their northern farming communities. That's what I'm driving at here in the timeline. Uh, began to leave their communities for high sea exploration as word gets around further and further that uh, there's money. There's money to be uh, had. There's some pillaging to be done. The age of settlement begins for the Vikings in the century. Vikings traveled as far as Russia to the east, and some even claim uh, that Vikings made it to present-day Rhode Island across the Atlantic. Uh, they for sure moved into uh, Scotland, Ireland, the Faroe Islands. Uh, in 840 CE, Vikings who uh, 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 who have now invaded present-day Ireland uh, f found the city of Dublin. I didn't realize that Dublin's origin, or, or if I did, I forgot, were actually uh, Scandinavian. Um, in 860 CE, Swedish Vikings attacked Constantinople, the capital of the uh, Byzantine Empire. While Norwegian Danish were focused uh, heading west and southeast, Swedish Vikings focused uh, east and southeast. They'd already been crossing the Baltic Sea and descending across Eastern Europe for years. They were branded Rus, possibly derived from Rutsi, uh, uh, a Finnish word I'm probably fucking up. Uh, Finnish word for Swedes means a crew of oarsmen, and, and that's the term from which Russia received its name. These Rus Vikings uh, established settlements along trade route to the Black and Caspian Seas, uh, even conquered native Slavic populations in present-day Russia, Belarus, Ukraine. In June of 860, the Vikings launched a surprise attack on Constantinople at a time when the city was left largely undefended as uh, Byzantine Emperor Michael III was off with his army fighting the uh, uh, Abbasid Caliphate in Asia Minor while the Byz uh, Byzantine Navy was engaged with Arab pirates on the Mediterranean Sea. And the Vikings plundered the suburbs of Constantinople, uh, launched some coastal raids around the Sea of uh, Marmara, in which they burned houses, churches, and monasteries, slaughtered uh, various people who weren't able to, uh, to make it and, uh, inside the city's walls. Uh, they never attempted to breach the city walls themselves. Uh, they just suddenly departed, likely heading back to ensure they could make it back home before winter sent it. And that was kind of their style. You know, a lot of these places, they didn't like uh, attack and then want to take over. Um, very different than Napoleon last week. He, he kept wanting to stay in places. They're like, nope, let's just get a bunch of shit. Let's bounce, rape, pillage, bounce, repeat. Uh, 861 CE, the now Scandinavian nation of Iceland is discovered. A Nordic explorer named Nadur was blown off course on his way to the Faroe Islands from Norway. It was uh, then that he discovered the previously unknown island, which he named Snowland. When he returned to Norway, he told everyone what he found. Six years later, an explorer named Floki Vilgerdersen uh, Floki Vilgerdersen Ding 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 
um, was the first person. To, <laughs> it's really fun to do, actually. Uh, was the first person to – now I want to do this just in my head. I just want to do like uh, some kind of weird Scandinavian banjo that for some reason the strings would sound much more bouncy. But ting to ting to bling to blanky. Ping the ping the ping the ping the ping the tink the tink. But ting the tink the piddly tink the tink the blink the tink plink pink tink the doodly dink ting the ding the dun the pink. Fucking I never even planned on doing that today. I just got caught up in the in the spirit. Odin! Odin commanded me to play the Swedish banjo. Um okay. I didn't get a lot of sleep and I'm feeling loopy and I like it. All right. Uh anyway. So uh, he turns to Norway, he tells everyone, this guy, Floki Vilgerdersen, is the first person to seek out and find Iceland on purpose, uh, the man who gave Iceland its name. He heads back home to Norway with more info on this new land. The myth goes that the name was meant to keep people away from the lush land, uh, but that is historically unclear if that's true. In 872 CE, the kingdom of Norway is formed when various smaller petty kingdoms band together. Sweden may have also been a kingdom at this time, we don't know. Uh, the written history of the Kingdom of Sweden usually begins at 970 with King Eric the Victorious. Tough to say uh, because, again, not a lot of written history and a lot of myths that are probably mostly made up. He's the first guy who's listed as the King of Sweden in numerous medieval writings written independently of each other. However, the tribe of the Swedes are mentioned by Roman historians as far back as the first century CE. Senator Tacitus uh, mentions encountering the Swedes in 44 and 45 CE, describes them as a powerful tribe distinguished not merely for their arms and men, but for their powerful fleets. So they were, you know, they were doing some cool shit with uh, boats for a long time. The Vikings in Denmark had existed in some form of uh, petty kingdoms who would band together for military conflicts, at least as early as the 6th century CE. Tribes from Denmark began plundering churches and monasteries in the early 9th century. I wish I had nice, precise dates for each country's inception, but we just don't. Uh, People lived in tribes. Tribes organized into coalitions of some sort. Coalitions evolved in little petty kingdoms, which evolved into what we call nations now. Just wasn't the same as other European nations, where thanks to more uh, written records and different cultural priorities, we have firm timelines. Uh, 874 CE, many people of Norway did not care for their king, Harald Fairhair, and many fled. One fleeing group led by Norway chieftain uh, Ingelfer Anhersen and his family landed on Iceland's southwest peninsula and created a settlement he named uh, Reyk- uh, Reykjavik which means Cove of Smoke. He and his people were the first to actually live on Iceland. The settlement would attract others from Norway, Scotland, and Ireland. Uh, Reykjavik uh, would become the nation's largest city in its capital. Today, over 100,000 people live there. I very much want to visit and hope that I run into Bjork. Where are you, Bjork? Bjork, can you hear me calling for you? Bjork, I want to play a song for you. Hing da hing da hing. Uh, we've lost all of our Scandinavian listeners about it, by the way. We were building in the markets of Sweden and Iceland, and it just went down to fucking zero. I just got a, I just got a message. I haven't even released this episode. And somehow, it's already gotten to the president of Iceland. He's like, fucking, we're done, dude. You're banned. Uh, by 878 CE, Danish-based Vikings have taken over northern and eastern England. Uh, in 911 CE, a Viking leader named Rollo, who had been based in France for about a decade, launched an unsuccessful raid on Paris. Uh, Later in that year, he went on to besiege another French city where, again, he was unsuccessful. However, his raids were making the king of France at that time. King Charles the Simple, I swear to God, that's what he was called, uh, is making King Charles nervous. Uh, Charles the Simple, that does not translate well. I'm sure it sounds better in French. In English, ah, he doesn't sound like a good king, man. Hello, people of France. I am ready to announce my title from this day forward. You will know me as Charles the Magnificent. Boo! It's not right. Doesn't work. Boo! All, all right, all right. What about Charles the Incredible? Boo! It's too much. It's not right for you. Boo! All right, Charles the Great. Boo! Charles, Charles the Good. Boo! Charles the Above Average, for fuck's sake. Boo! Uh, how about Charles the Simple? Is that pathetic enough for you? Does that lower me and humble me enough? Hip, hip, hooray! Long live Charles the Simple! Uh, I don't know. I don't know how it happened. Simple Charles agreed to offer Rollo the northwestern corner of France uh, in return for Rollo's allegiance. As part of the agreement, Rollo, his court and army converted to Christianity, and he took the name of Robert. Uh, Robert's alliance to the king did not require him to renounce raiding territory outside Charles' jurisdiction. And from the point of view of land acquisition... 
He continued to act as a Viking chief, still carrying out expeditions, raids, expanding territory when he could. And this is a story of, of how the French Reman, <laughs> French Reman, the French region of Normandy got its name. Medieval Latin documents referred to Rollo and his men as Nortmani, which means men of the north. This name provides the etymological basis for the words Norman and Normandy. All right, it's a little, little extra trivia. Yeah, Vikings starting off Normandy. Now let's talk about Greenland, a nation giving Siberia a run for its money when it comes to the least desirable vacation destination place in the entire fucking world. In 982 CE, Eric the Red discovered and began the settlement of Greenland. Uh, his father, according to the sagas, had been exiled from Norway in 960 CE as a result of, quote, a number of killings. Eric's entire family uh, decides to follow. Uh, they relocate in England, or I'm sorry, in Iceland. They relocate in Iceland. And then Eric called the Red, uh, not just due to his red hair and beard, but also because of his fiery temper. Uh, this ginger savage gets exiled in 982 for three years from Iceland for three murders committed there. This family exiled twice in just uh, over two decades. Due to his exile, he sails west, discovers a country with an inviting fjord landscape and fertile green valleys. He's so impressed with this new country's resources that he returns to Iceland to spread the word of the green land. You know, just, hey guys, I, I know I'm not supposed to be here. I know, yeah, I was exiled and stuff, hey. Uh, but I found a really cool place to live and I promise I'll head back there and stay if you just let me get my shit together. And then in 985, Eric returns to Greenland, leading a fleet of 25 ships on board were around 500 men and women, domestic animals, other elements requir required to create a new existence in a new land. Of the 25 ships, only 14 make it to their destination. And I'm guessing all on board were pretty pissed. Uh, it wasn't as nice as he had made out. Eric the Red established the chieftain's uh, seat of power in southern Greenland, while others continued further north. Uh, the two societies located in, in uh, uh, words that don't even look real. There's so many consonants. Uh, were known as the East and West Settlements, basically. The Norse people, by the way, would completely abandon Greenland. Not that much later, really, during the 15th century, because it is a frozen shithole of a country. Uh, some local indigenous people have stayed because I don't, I, fuck, I don't know why. why. Why do Eskimos still live in a, in a terrible frozen wasteland? Uh, Greenland appears to be one of the worst places in Earth. I'm not kidding. It's literally never gotten to even 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 27 degrees Celsius, ever in one fucking day, not for one day in any place on the whole island. Records are broken when the weather hits 75 degrees Fahrenheit in June. That's fucking heat wave. Its biggest city has less than 20,000 people in its metro area, which means that Greenland doesn't have any cities. And again, why? It's a frozen shithole. The country is over 800,000 square miles in size, over three times the size of the state of Texas, over 15 times the size of England, over eight times the size of New, e New Zealand, and less than 60,000 people live there in total. Has the lowest population density of any nation on earth by far, and you know why. You, you can guess now. Yep, uh-huh, frozen shithole. Over 75% of the island, the world's largest island due to Australia and Antarctica being defined as continents, uh, or Antarctica, um, over 75% of Greenland is covered in ice year round. I, I bet no one is hoping for global warming to continue more <laughs> than the approximately 50,000 sad motherfuckers living in a nightmare of a country. I, I'm going to go to visit uh, Greenland right after I swing through Siberia and Syria on my thank Nimrod, I don't have to live in these places world tour. Uh, sorry, I know that was a bit much, but just I, I got looking into Greenland. I was like, why? Why would anyone live here? Uh, Eric the Red, he did make the most of his time in Greenland, able to produce a number of goods for trade during that time, including fur, wool, sheep, whale blubber, walrus ivory. Until by 1408, demand for whale blubber had waned a bit, uh, hurting trade and temperatures had lowered due to a little mini ice age. And the, uh, the average temperature there went from, fuck, this is cold, to we're all going to die here. You know that, right? We are all dead here. Uh, and they take off. Towards the end of the Viking era, possibly as early as 986 CE, but probably a little closer to 999 CE, the Vikings became in all likelihood the first Europeans to spot North America. Uh, since indigenous people walked from Alaska, or excuse me, walked into Alaska from Siberia via a frozen land bridge thousands of years earlier, a trader with a super fun name of Bjarni Hurljelsen. Uh, Hi, I'm Bjarni Hurlchelsen. <laughs> uh, I love their names so much. They're my favorite names. 
I'm Bjarni Hjolsson. I like to have some fun. Ding dong, ting ding, tong ding, ting. Um, I just can't picture these people being sad with these names. Yeah, which is so insulting. I I know it is. And again, Scandinavian listeners, I apologize. It just I it comes from a place of love. I love your sing songy names. <laughs> uh, this guy's blown off uh, off course on his way to Greenland. He, he and his crew sight some lands to the west. When he makes anchor in Greenland, he describes what he sees to, to Leif Erikson, son of Eric the Red. Uh, I actually think that part of the reason that Eric and Leif are so well-known in English-speaking cultures is because they don't have uh, sw- Swedish chef names, like Bjarni Hjolfsson. Um, uh, Leif puts together a crew in, in 1000 CE, sails 1,800 miles across the really cold part of the Atlantic, and, and makes it to Newfoundland, around 1000 CE, around. Uh, Viking sagas claim a settlement was built and named Vineland. Uh, an abundance of trees, game, and grapes are found, later inspired the name Vineland. Uh, apparently, though, the colony, colony would fail due to hostile natives some 10, 15 years later. Again, experts are skeptical of the old Nordic history, kind of in general, but there is an uh, archaeologist verifying certain things, and they have verified that, you know, uh, uh, Leif Erikson or, or somebody, some Vikings, some Nordic people did make it to Newfoundland. In 1960, archaeologist team Anne Steind Ingsted, or Ingstad, and her husband uh, Helga unearthed a Norse settlement in Newfoundland at uh, Lanso Meadows that dates to roughly 1000 CE. So it kind of validates, you know, the timeline of Leif's journey. They found eight Nordic homes, a forge, and four workshops. Uh, also, some say on uh, this little community, uh, some say Leif's sister, uh, Freija, uh, Eric Dosti, or, er, or, or God damn it, Eric Dosti, uh, Freija Eric Dosti, was the first European to give birth on American soil. It's also thought she fought off an entire clan of warriors while she was pregnant. It's Hail is Uh And again, though, the settlement will be abandoned by around uh, 1015 CE. In 1013, some other Vikings conquer uh, all of England. The king of Denmark, Sven Forkbeard. Great name. Oh, King Forkbeard. Um, Lord of both Norway and Sweden. Invades England with a large fleet. After a brief campaign, he he secures submission of all the English people apart from the inhabitants of London, who he essentially holds hostage. When a near contemporary English chronicle reports, all the nation regards him as full king. Uh, The citizens of London finally capitulate and submit giving the Danes, uh, you know, uh, um, actually gi- actually giving them some, or, or they just agree. They just agree that they're going to be part of, uh, yeah, this new Nordic land. The Vikings have been raiding the British Isles for over two centuries now, and they wanted to settle it, use this land for farming, and have a more hospitable climate and great location from where they could launch even more raids and take even more people's shit. Uh, this invasion may have also uh, happened in response to the St. Bryce's Day Massacre of 1002, England had been ravaged by Danish Viking raids, you know, constantly, uh, especially in the years 997 to uh, 1001. And in 1002, the king, uh, Ethelred the Unready, another great name, was told that the Danish men in England would faithlessly take his life and then all his counselors and possess his kingdom afterwards. In response, he orders the death of all Danes living in England. On November 13th, 1002, various killings are carried out. The bones of roughly 40 Viking warriors were found during an excavation in 2008 in Oxford, England. Unknown how many Vikings in total were massacred in the country. Uh, in, 10, 000, in 1014, Old Forkbeard dies, and his son Canute is left to rule a Scandinavian Viking empire com- uh, comprised of England, Denmark, and Norway. After Canute's death, his two sons succeed him. Both, though, are, are dead by 1042, and then Edward the Confessor, son of the previous non-Danish king, <laughs> Uh, old Captain Unready, right, uh, uh, returned from uh, exile and regained the English throne from, uh, from the Danes. Upon his death without heirs in 1066, Harold Godwinson, uh, the son of Edward's most powerful noble, lays claim to the throne. And then Harold's army is able to defeat an invasion led by the last great Viking king, Harald uh, Hardrada of Norway, at Stamford Bridge near York, present day York, after the Vikings had beaten the English initially near present day. Uh, also near present-day York, in the Battle of Fulford. Um, uh, Harald Hardrada dies at Stamford Bridge in an intense way. This 50-year-old uh, warrior king was struck in the throat by an arrow and killed early in the battle in a state of berserker mode, is what the legend says, having worn no body armor and fought aggressively with both hands around his sword. More ongoing berserker, uh, just a little bit later. It is intense. Harold Godwinson wins... 
but then uh, falls himself just weeks later to the forces of William, Duke of Normandy, himself a descendant of Scandinavian settlers in northern France, but no longer a part of uh, the Viking culture. This, uh, this William goes on to become William the Conqueror, you know, crowned King of England on Christmas Day in 1066, 1066. Uh, William manages to then retain the crown against further Danish challenges. And, and that ends when he's able to successfully defend, con, you know, consistently against the uh, Danish challengers. That ends the Viking era and also ends today's Time Suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Okay, after that barrage of dates and names, let's all pep up. Let's pep up. Let's talk about something more exciting than numbers. Let's talk about Viking weapons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did the Vikings kick ass in England, France, all the way down in Constantinople and elsewhere? Well, uh, they had some decent weapons. Helped. The most popular Viking weapons were axes and spears. Now, spears uh, are obviously pieces of metal on sticks. Probably iron. Nothing too exciting unless you're somebody like serial killer Ed Kemper. Oh, man, he would have loved to uh, have been able to use a spear. He would have made a great spear-wielding Viking, right? Mother, I'm a Viking now! I got my own stick weapon, mother! My new boss, Jarl Sven Bloodhoof, said I can put as many heads on the sticks as I want! He, he even said uh, I can be something called a berserker, mother! I can make my zapples work in battle, mother! Oh, gotta go sharpen my war stick now! Time to set your head back on the mantle, mother. I pray to Odin I return safely from war and can celebrate by drinking your cat's blood out of my horn tonkard and fucking your stupid neck, mother! Now, if you're thinking, new listener, what the hell just happened? I get it. Uh, here's what happened. We just covered Ed Kemper a while back, and I, I found out he blamed his killings on Zapples. And they loved putting heads on sticks and hated mother and, uh, and did literally fuck her neck. And I thought that voice would be fun to accompany all that information with. Anywho. Back to war weapons. Uh, the Viking battle axe, synonymous. That's the exciting one for most people. Synonymous with the current image of the Viking. Most of the axes were simple. Others were uh, uh, badass death utensils, beautifully decorated with engraved artwork. Right, like, like a Thor axe. You know, the uh, Thor's war hammer. I guess he didn't have an axe. He had a war hammer. But I'm, I'm picturing it being ornate like that. Uh, the axe doubled as a craftsman's tool uh, during travel between battles. It caused lethal damage in a number of ways. Viking axes, uh, you know, varied. Mostly made of iron. Nearly always uh, had either pagan or Christian symbols etched into them out of ref uh, reverence, uh, reference, God damn it, reverence, duh, and superstition. Christian missionaries, by the way, had been converting various Vikings to Christianity all throughout the Viking era. Uh, swords were less popular in the Viking era, mostly due to them being expensive. A sword was, uh, you know, it's, it's like having a, having a private jet in the 10th or 11th century. Only the wealthiest Vikings and merchants could afford this superior weapon. Uh, averaging 90 centimeters in length, about 35 inches. These big, bad killing machines were often decorated with gold and silver plates, intricate etchings, precious stones. I think it goes without saying that the Vikings that did have uh, swords loved the shit out of them. It was customary to sleep with uh, their sword, and obviously you would want to name it. Wealthy Vikings and other wealthy sword lovers would sometimes even opt to be buried with their swords instead of passing those swords down to their families, which probably, uh, you know, uh, pissed off some kids. Just, I can't believe Dad took a sword to the grave. Selfish dick. King Fork bead my ass. More King Fuckface. Um, the most common of all Viking items of war was the shield. While it was common for defense, it could also be used as a weapon itself. And as we shall soon discuss, sometimes dudes would even gnaw on it to get hyped for battle. Uh, not kidding. The round 80 to 100 centimeter in diameter shield was often held in one hand and whatever crazy sharp iron thing was held in the other. The only piece of metal on the Viking shields was the iron handle. In almost all Viking archaeological sites where shields are found, only the iron handle remains. Uh, bows were a part of the Viking artillery uh, and were especially useful in ship-to-ship -ship or ship-to-land warfare. With a 200-meter firing distance, Viking bows were big and tough, crafted from ash or elm trees. They shot arrows tipped with iron. They could pummel enemies on shore before unloading their boats and attacking with their axes or sending in their berserkers. Berserkers! Uh, the Vikings had numerous weapons of war, sophisticated tactics to use them. They also used ja uh, javelins and slings to help uh, make people die. Viking helmets, although not fit with horns, were also expensive and valuable weapons. 
Um, uh, there, there was a modern misconception that all Vikings wore helmets, that they all had horns. Not, not sure. Actually, only the richest Vikings could afford uh, nice helmets or, or really like helmets in general. If, if you had a helmet and a sword, other Vikings knew that you weren't dicking around or that you had a rich dad. Um, the most valuable tool of war the Vikings had wasn't something they could hold. It was their incredible boats that gave them a significant advantage against many of their op opponents, especially early in the Viking era. Perhaps all of Nordic life uh, hinged on uh, their boat building. It was obviously essential uh, for exploration, but there were uh, the boats were also used for daily transportation, fishing, recreation. Uh, boats were just a big source of Viking pride. Men who owned boats would often be buried or burned at sea in them. Uh, boat building was a tradition that went back hundreds of years before the Vikings, as we learned earlier. These boats were more technologically advanced than any naval equipment their enemies possessed. Uh, when they kicked off their era of raping and pillaging. Uh, and speaking of that, did, did the Vikings really uh, do all this, you know, crazy amount of raping, by the way? I mean, the, the short answer is yes, but they didn't necessarily uh, do any more raping and pillaging than other cultures did back then. Uh, maybe a little more pillaging than the average, but not, but not a lot more uh, raping. There's no evidence that they were particularly rapey. Uh, raping their own women would have been a serious crime, a serious as murder, and if they did rape their own women, uh, a man could legally, uh, you know, another man could legally kill them for doing that. But they, uh, they did rape the women of their opponents, as did many other warriors of the time. The spoils of war just weren't limited to uh, an enemy's physical treasure. They could, and would often do what they wanted to the enemy's women as well. Part of that was just to inflict more psychological damage on, uh, you know, their enemies. Uh, part of it was, I guess, just because they were, uh, you know. Uh, terrible people in ways back then, uh, just in general, and they could just get away with it. Um, but again, uh, they did, the, they did this stuff as did many other people. Life was just terrible back then for a lot of people, as we're so often reminded. Uh, so back to boats, the Vikings had two main types of big boats. The long ships were built for war and a type of ship called the Nar was built for trade. Uh, perhaps the most well-known, the Viking longships dominated the world's oceans for around 300 years. Uh, these ships were superior to other European ships at the time for a number of reasons. They were lighter, stronger, more maneuverable. Uh, they were built with the advantage of reversing direction at will. They had shallower holes than many other ships. And above all, they were a lot more flexible than anything else out on the seas. And the flexibility of these ships, you know, gave Vikings uh, uh, the confidence to travel hundreds and even thousands of miles from home. While storms would be tearing apart, you know, other fleets, Viking fleets, could handle a lot of that rough water. I mean, some boats, sure, was, were still lost to storms, but not as many as their counterparts. It, it, and it was also the, the depth of the Viking hulls. That was huge. This was what made their ships so dangerous in battle. Unlike larger ships at the time that needed deep harbors, these Viking longships could travel in waters as shallow as three to four feet in depth. Uh, the Vikings' uh, ships were built to make beach landings, right? And also to travel up rivers hundreds of miles into mainlands. Uh, this gave the, the North, North men a, a huge advantage in surprising their enemies. It allowed them to, to, you know, build, uh, impenetrable forts of their own further inland, uh, than any other fleet could get to. Uh, the Vikings made many improvements to sailing technology from better masts and keels to better ship designs and navigational equipment. Viking explorers often receive uh, credit for inventing the magnetic compass and the sun compass. Let's talk about these trading ships. Uh, again, known as the NAR, they were uh, uh, much wider and deeper than the warships. They were built sturdy enough to cross the Atlantic, filled with people, livestock, and goods. Uh, one ship that was excavated dating back to the 11th century was 45 feet long, 11 feet wide, and could carry up to 4.6 uh, tons of cargo. Uh, they also built a variety of smaller ships intended for quick transportation, fishing, and trade. These ships were meant to be light enough to carry uh, you know, uh, over land, but strong enough to carry heavy cargo. Uh, Shipbuilding techniques were trade secrets, guarded trade secrets, but also uh, much of the work in building the ships was done by slaves. Um, and, and that kind of leads us to perhaps the main purpose of these ships. Uh, Viking seamen were, were given uh, great military advantages via their superior boats, and many experts say that they built a slave economy around these advantages. Slaves were vital to the Viking way of life. Uh, although, like everything Viking, it's debated, many historians consider slave capturing to be the primary motivation for Viking raids. Uh, some historians think that in, in addition to look at, looking for treasure, uh, they were looking for women to be either sex slaves or wives. The hypothesis goes that because Viking leaders would take multiple wives, non-elite Vikings would be forced to go steal a wife or two from their neighbors. 
Uh, some evidence of this would be that the majority of Icelandic women have Scottish and Irish ancestors, while 80% of the Icelandic men are mainly Nordic Germanic. Uh, the Nordic version of slavery actually predates the Vikings by hundreds of years. Uh, there is some evidence of slavery in the region as early as the first century uh, CE. The Nordic and Viking forms of slavery at least had nothing to do with uh, race. Uh, it was more along the line of whoever uh, happened to be there when they showed up, right? It's whoever was close when they decided to grab some slaves. Um, does, does, does not caring about the race make it better? I'm not sure, actually. I, I doubt the slaves themselves took any comfort whatsoever in knowing that their slavery uh, wasn't based in racism. I doubt they were, you know, having conversation like, this, is, this sucks, Seamus. Last year around this time, we were hanging out back in Ireland, eating sausage with Ma and Pa and drinking dark beer. Now we're slaves here in Stockholm. It's not that bad, Quinn. At least the people beating us and raping our wives aren't racist. Uh, <laughs> there's no doubt that being a Viking slave would have been terrible. Archaeologists have found evidence of slaves living with livestock and that some were sometimes burned alive or even worse, ritually sacrificed, which included beheadings. Again, history is murky on everything uh, Viking related, but the evidence seems to be mounting that they did have uh, a lot of slaves. Uh, the Annals of Ulster, an Irish docu document, chronicles a raid in Dublin. Uh, Ireland around 821 CE that says a great booty of women were taken. Uh, then it chron chronicles 100 years later that Vikings uh, took 3,000 slaves. There were also Arab and Middle Eastern accounts that chronicled the Viking slave trade. Viking slaves traveled all the way from Scandinavia to Russia to the Byzantine Empire, even as far as Baghdad. Uh, some historians today even debate whether or not uh, uh, some, some ancient Viking homes and structures were actually more of, a, more of kind of you know, early plantations. There's, there's evidence that as shipbuilding became more popular, wool sales became more in demand, so too did slave labor. Uh, besides sex work, female slaves were made to do domestic chores and cook. Male slaves did a lot of the logging, building of the boats, rowing on the master's ships. Some evidence exists that slaves were also put into warrior classes and forced to fight in battles. Uh, Vikings, according to some records, uh, named their slaves things like uh, bastard, sluggard, stumpy, uh, stinker, dipshit, uh, fuckface McGee, hungy dungy, boingy dung tung, slinky slanky. Um, and I just think that kind of shed some light on how to, uh, how the Vikings, you know, thought about their slaves. Uh, those name records, by the way, if you look into it, they do come entirely from the back of my mind. Uh, you, you won't find them written anywhere. The really shitty part for both male and female slaves probably had to be the ritual sacrifices. Uh, or, or even just living a life knowing that you could be sacrificed at any point, just having that anxiety. It's got to be terrible. Uh, according to the Nordic sagas and some Arab chronicles, when their masters died, slaves would usually be killed and buried with them. Uh, sometimes it would be a single concubine. Sometimes it would be uh, every slave. Um, okay, now let's talk about the ultimate Viking warriors, the berserkers. This shit is intense. The berserkers were the most feared type of Norse warrior. Berserkers were a wild, brutally violent sect of Norse warriors who ended up being written uh, as villains in many of the Nordic sagas. Uh, we get the English word berserk, an adjective that means out of control with anger or excitement, wild or frenzied, from these crazy bastards. Uh, the berserkers and their nearly identical counterparts, the wolfskins or heathen wolves, were secret societies of elite, batshit crazy warriors that took violence to an almost unfathomable level and, and did a lot to earn Vikings their brutal reputations. They were closely connected to another group, the cult of Odin, uh, that were also pretty brutal. Uh, berserker comes from the ancient Norse word uh, serker which means coat or shirt, and the word burr, which means bear. You know, it's like bear coat, bear shirt. Uh, the, these uh, bear shirts and these fuckers uh, uh, marched e either completely naked into battle or, or uh, had like a bear or like a wolf pelt just to cover themselves. Uh, they were used many times as shock troops to terrorize the minds of the enemy and scatter their formations. Uh, some berserkers devoted their, their lives completely to these sects. The title of berserker was often passed down from father to son, like a Zorro or maybe Batman, you know, who knows? Uh, ho whole families were Berserker cult members. The alleged goal of the Berserker or the Wolfskin was to actually transform into their totem animal, right? If they were a wolf, they would mimic the mannerisms and the habits of the wolf. Uh, they would get out there in the woods. They would, with their bare hands, they would get good enough to actually catch wild wolves, like no weapons. Uh, so they could tame these wolves. Uh, true kind of wolfskin berserkers. They would they would tame a whole and eventually just fuck these wolves and they would make like these weird wolf human baby things that would become like the elite guard of the berserkers with the with the half wolves. Uh, you know, like they had like fucking crazy ass long paw things and then like human heads. 
and they were the best. No, I'm getting way off track. Um, no, but they, they but they would want to become these animals. They would mimic the habits. Uh, hardcore berserkers would even spend time living in the woods. So that part's true. Uh, but they would just wear the skin and fur of the wolf. They would uh, drink wolf blood in rituals to complete this transformation in their minds. The Nordic sagas and even other retellings of the time call these uh, these people shapeshifters. Before battle, it said that berserkers would rile themselves up in rituals meant to bring the beast that lived inside of them out. There can be only one Highlander. There can be only one berserker. Except they probably wouldn't say it, uh, you know, that like intensely. There can be only one berserker. Hing da hung da. Uh, uh, they were known to bite and gnaw on their wooden shields, mindlessly attacking stones and trees. They'd sometimes kill each other as they waited for battle. <laughs> That's uh, part of the record. Uh, they would call this ritualized insanity berserk gang or, or a berserk gang. A 13th century poet wrote of one berserker, a demoniacal frenzy suddenly took him. He furiously bit and devoured the edges of his shield. He snatched live embers in his mouth and let them pass down into his entrails. He rushed through the perils of crackling fires, and at last, when he had raved through every sort of madness, he turned his sword with raging hand against the heart of six of his champions. It is doubtful whether his madness came from thirst for battle or natural ferocity. Shit sounds intense! Even a less exaggerated version of that sounds super intense. Uh, although there is no evidence of this, some scholars seem to think the berserkers would get high out of their minds on mushrooms uh, and or booze, perhaps a little hemlock to get themselves into a wild fit of rage. Uh, they're said to have lost all reason and self-awareness and could not distinguish between friend or foe. Berserkers were perceived by their enemies as immune to fire, swords, and iron weapons. They are said to have found, uh, had no fear uh, of weapons, felt no pain. There were some rituals involved in going berserk. Yeah, they believed that they got their power from altered states brought on by these rituals. They would go, uh, they would they would see visions through extreme isolation, fasting, exposure to extreme temperatures, both hot and cold. They would even do like weird naked group weapons dances before battle. I mean, can you imagine seeing that kind of shit for the first time if you're a scout for some enemy army? Th that would be very hard to process and report. Did you locate any hostile forces, William? Yes, sire. Indeed, I did, sire. How many men? Uh, roughly, roughly 50, sire. Excellent, William. We should have no problem then. We easily outnum outnumber them two to one. And with all due respect, I think we should head back, sire. Why in God's name should we do that, William? They're, they're naked, sire. Excuse me, William, did you say naked? Uh, yes, sire, and they're dancing, sire, and, and hitting each other, and spilling each other's blood, and drinking blood, and chewing on shields and each other, sire. They're, they're walking on fire and pounding ale, sire. And if my Norse is correct, they're chanting horrible things like, eat their babies, fuck their dead, eat their babies, fuck their dead. I'm quite terrified, sire. Uh, you can smell the fear, sire. Uh, yeah, these people are fucking crazy. One berserker is said to have eaten his shield before killing six guys. Uh, <laughs> berserkers did a lot of things that people think of when they think of Vikings. They pillaged and raped and murdered their way from settlement to settlement. Sagas tell the berserkers ripping men apart with their bare hands, biting their, the throats out of their enemies. All with their dicks out there flying in the wind. Uh, within their own Scandinavian societies, berserkers were brawlers and killers. They disrupted their cultures so much. Uh, their secret societies eventually actually were outlawed. And by the 12th century, they were extinct. Uh, and apparently, yeah, berserkers, not always good for Viking battle strategy. Uh, sometimes they, they would charge when they're supposed to hold. Sometimes they would just start fighting <laughs> uh, everybody around them, their fellow troops instead of the enemy. Uh, after the battles were, were over, uh, they were apparently also weak as babies. Right when they came out of their trances, like they had like a little berserker type hangover. Uh, okay, so that's the berserkers. Um, uh, but as I've stated earlier, the Vikings weren't just warriors; uh, they were also farmers, traders, artisans, and more. Uh, let's talk now a bit about Viking ladies. Uh, women had more rights than many of their European counterparts in Viking society. Uh, they could run a clan, own uh, property, uh, own a business, even initiate divorce. Uh, the idea of a Viking warrior woman has been romanticized in more recent times, but uh, seems to go up against the Viking code. Uh, the debate over whether or not women warriors existed heated up as recently as 2017 when new DNA evidence of a Viking warrior seemed to prove that the warrior was female. And then that evidence was later disproven. However, uh, female warriors do exist in the Viking sagas. However, those sagas are definitely mostly fiction. Uh, warriors or not, Viking women played important and honored roles in Nordic society. Among them was tending to the wounded on the battlefield. They even concocted a special soup made of onions, leeks, and herbs. Uh, or herbs. 
uh, that would allegedly seep through the deep wounds, the smell of which would indicate irreparable damage. Uh, in this way, the, the, the women could supposedly tell which warriors were going to die and put their energy towards the ones that had a better chance of living. Uh, let's talk a little more about those sagas. Viking stories written mainly in Iceland between the 12th and 4th centuries. Uh, Snorri Sturluson, we talked a lot about him in the Norse Godsuck. He wrote a lot of these sagas. Uh, many other authors, many of them unknown, uh, wrote uh, the others. The sagas featured three important female categories besides uh, the goddesses, and these are the shield maidens, the um, Valkyries, and the heroines. Uh, shield maidens, female warriors, are the most famous despite the lack of any archaeological evidence for them. It's claimed in 750 CE that 300 shield maidens fought for the Danes in the Battle of Ravala. Um, in one epic tale, a shield maiden named Blenda of Smaland, of Smaland, uh, Smaland uh, saved her country from invasion uh, of the Danish by inviting Danish warriors to a large feast, getting them drunk, and then uh, with an army of ladies murdering them all in their sleep. Hail is to Fena! Uh, Valkyries are the shield maidens of the afterlife. In the sagas, they are said to lead the fallen souls uh, of the battlefield to their main god, Odin's Hall of Valhalla. Uh, the Valkyries play many different roles in the sagas, and one story of Valkyrie named uh, Brynhild becomes mortal again and avenges her own death. Pretty badass story. Uh, women are also elevated to hero status in many of the myths, legends, and semi-history. A few of the most famous women are two of their goddesses, uh, Skadi, goddess of hunting and skiing, and Freya, uh, goddess of fertility, love, and luck. There were many female leaders in various Nordic sagas, sagas as well. Uh, Sigrid the Proud ruled her kingdom, um, or Sigrid, Sigrid the Proud ruled her kingdom and was said to murder the men who wanted to marry her. A heroic uh, woman named Herver was the wielder of a magic sword called uh, uh, Tirfing, and a woman named Lagertha, uh, Lagertha was featured and famous in the sagas for being a victorious shieldmate. Uh, women explorers also featured in the sagas, uh, Ode, the deep-minded commanded her own fleet and settled Iceland. Uh, a Viking explorer, uh, uh, Gertrud Thorin Dutter, uh, was an explorer of North America's Vineland. Uh, perhaps the most famous Viking uh, warrior woman is Lucifina, the greatest warrior the North has ever seen. Able to slay a hundred berserkers with one swing of her mighty death axe. Able to pillage entire British cities with a battle cry that would transform into a hurricane. Able to sink ships with the help of the Kraken. She herself rides up out of the depths upon its back. Her hellhound Bojangles at her side. Bojangles shooting lightning at enemy mass with his one remaining eye. Shaking fear into the hearts of enemy sailors with roars that shake chests like thunder shakes souls. Hail Lucifina. That's who I think the most famous Viking warrior woman is. Uh, but you're not going to find Lucifina in any Norse history books. Historians, on the other hand, will tell you that perhaps the most famous Viking woman is Eric the Red's daughter, uh, Freydis, uh, Eric's daughter. Her last name is literally Eric's daughter. Uh, she explored the Atlantic with her famous brother, Leif Eriksson, uh, son of Eric, and her husband, and ha has many legends surrounding her toughness and her own brutality. Now let's look at some famous dudes. Several famous Viking men whose legends best tell the Viking tales. Um, perhaps not all those legends are, you know, historically accurate, but they capture the spirit of the Nordic people of the time. Here are just a few of the most uh, famous or interesting folks that I have found. A few of them we've already met. Uh, probably the two most famous Vikings are Eric the Red, founder of Greenland, and his son Leif, uh, Leif Erikson, the dude who discovered North America for the Vikings. But we've already talked about them. So let's move on to a dude with the super Viking name. Uh, Olav Tryggvason. Or Tryggvason. Olaf Tryggvason. Uh, Olaf was a warrior king. The grandson of the first ruler of the United Kingdom of Norway, uh, Harald Fairhair. Olav was uh, born around 968 CE, would go on to lead invasions into England starting in 991. Um, yeah, 991, the English were attacked so often by the Vikings, they came up with the term Dengeld, which, uh, which was simply just payments. It was a term for payments to the Vikings, not to kill them. You know, uh, Vikings probably didn't invent extortion, but they did perfect it, it seems. Uh, Olaf uh, was paid uh, a Dengeld in 19, or 991 not to attack England anymore. So in 994, he and the king of Denmark, Swain Forkbeard, um, or Sven Forkbeard, launched another attack on England to get them to stop the English paid a higher uh, Dengeld. Uh, the following year, with the English treasure he had earned, Olaf set his sights on invading Norway after battling and killing uh, Haken uh, Sigurdsson, uh, Hakon the Great, he was made king of Norway. He went on to make all this, uh, all the, his 
then pagan subjects convert to Christianity. Uh, Olaf didn't make a lot of friends with his ideas. One of his more powerful enemies was his old ally, Sven Forkbeard, and another was Eric Hawkinson, the son of the Norwegian king he just killed. Uh, Olaf would later be ambushed, uh, according to legend, by a thousand men. But instead of surrendering, he jumped into the ocean never to be seen again. Uh, the famous Viking son of Harald Fairhair was given the colorful name of Eric Bloodaxe, uh, born Eric Haraldson. Uh, King Fairhair ha had his boy murdering people and raiding Europe when he was just 12. Eric got his name by playing nice with the other children, but then slaughtering all but one of his brothers with an axe. Uh, like, like most prolific psychos of the time, he, he briefly ruled Norway before he was driven out, uh, eventually settling in Northumbria, uh, where he would become king. Mr. Bloodaxe battled constantly and was eventually killed. And it seems these Viking chieftains, uh, a lot of times, were either killed in battle or would live happily ever after. Uh, Ragnar Lothbrok and Sons, let's talk about them. Another family of interesting characters from the sagas. Uh, um, both sons, Ivar the Boneless and Bjorn Ironside, like their father, would become kings. They would all lead many raids. Ragnar Lothbrok, uh, uh, who was a berserker, is famous today for his role on the History Channel show Vikings. Very prominent in the Viking sagas and is famous for being paid by the French King Charles. 7,000 pounds of silver not to sack Paris. Uh, Ragnar's son, Ivar the Boneless, had a bone disease that made his legs break easily, but he still fought in battle. He was supposedly carried by his men, and then he would attack with a bow and arrow. Pretty impressive, if that's true. Uh, it was Ivar the Boneless who also conducted, supposedly, the brutal ritual torture called the Blood Eagle that we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Uh, when he sacked York during one of his raids in Northumbria, uh, he took the King Ayel, the man who had his father, Harald Fairhair, executed and fucked him up. Blood eagle, sick shit. One of the most god-awful ways to die. Um, brutal. Stay tuned. Uh, Bjorn Ironside, the other fair hair kid, was also a violent son of a bitch. He raided as far as France, Spain, Sicily, North Africa, and Italy. One great story from the sagas describes Bjorn's attempts to breach the gates of an Italian city. As his army awaited outside, he pretended to be dead. Uh, his men called to the priests in the city. The Italian holy men brought him inside to be buried. When they carried the coffin to the church, Mr. Ironside uh, supposedly leapt out of the casket, killed a whole bunch of dudes, fought his way back to the gates, and then led in his army to, uh, to take over the town. And then this fucker, fucker also supposedly retired in wealth and comfort. Uh, Egil Scarlet Grimson, Egil Scarlet Grimson, come in for Lutevisk. Um, he's the quintessential warrior poet. He's said to have written his first poem at age three, have killed his first human with an axe at the age of seven. <laughs> hope that's just legend. Not That's fucking terrifying. Uh, this was a man who the sagas say took on 11 men at once, also wrote some of the finest poems of his age. He was a lover and a fighter. He was described as a complex man. He had a very sensitive side, but he could also gouge a few eyes out, able to rip men apart and tear out people's throats with his teeth and cry over a sunset. This Viking hero, like so many others, lived a long 80-year life of luxury after a lifetime of brutality. Uh, another really interesting character was uh, Gunir uh, Hamundarsson, perhaps the most famous swordsman of the Nordic sagas and legends. He had comic book level skills. The legend described his as being able to jump uh, higher than he was tall uh, while wearing a, a full suit of armor. Uh, okay. Yeah, sure. Cool story, bro. Uh, Gunnar was e equally uh, excellent, or uh, Gunir. Uh, Gunir was equally excellent with both hands as a swordsman in an eagle eye with a bow. Uh, the sagas say he had absolutely terrorized Denmark and Norway. His cruelty would come back to Hanna. While in the midst of a blood feud that he started, he broke his bowstring. And then when he asked his wife to, hey, give me some of your hair to repair it. She said no, because he had hit her previously. Ah, and then he got fucked up. Whoops. The last great Viking king is the last famous Viking we'll delve into. Uh, Harald Hardrada, the berserker, uh, you know, uh, king we talked about earlier. Born in Norway in 1015 uh, as Harald uh, Sigurdsson. Uh, he was fighting as a teen in the famous battle of Stikold Istid in 1030. The conflict was started by his half-brother, Olaf Haraldsson, who was the freshly exiled king of Norway. In an effort to regain power, the brothers fought the Norwegians and were defeated. And this is where Harald's story gets very interesting. After the defeat, he's exiled, right? He, uh, he hooks up with Thor's uh, exile travel agency. He finds himself in Kiev, becomes a mercenary for uh, Jaroslav the Wise, the Grand Prince of Kiev. He then travels to Constantinople to join and eventually captain the Byzantine Emperor's prestigious uh, Varangian Guard. Harald's military success makes him wealthy. Uh, his name, uh, Har Hardrada, meant hard ruler. 
In 1040, he returns to Scandinavia, forms an alliance with a uh, claimant for the Danish throne, Sven uh, Eritsson, uh, in a plot to overthrow then King of Norway and Denmark, uh, King Magnus the Good. In 1046, the partnership between Sven and Harald dissolves when King Magnus knows what's good for him, makes uh, Harald co-ruler of Norway. After Magnus dies in 1047, Sven becomes the King of Denmark, and Harald and Sven uh, begin their multi-year war. Uh, Harald won most of the battles, but by 1064, he was ready to settle uh, for Sven remaining King of Denmark. Harald, a man with war on the brain, shifted his focus to England in 1066. Uh, 1066, excuse me, he led a large force, including 300 ships, to York in Northumbria, uh, and took the city at the Battle of Full uh, Fulford Gate, like we talked about. And just days after the victory, as we know, Harold Godwinson wiped out his army at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. And uh, and I know there are tons of other famous Vikings that I've missed, and we just kind of skimmed over these. But you know, this is this is a broad stroke kind of suck. Uh, and I think it's time we get to some fucked up rituals because I'm tired of all these names. Let's get to something crazy. Uh, so the Berserkers were pretty bad or, or badass or both, but uh, Berserkers weren't the only or overly brutal Vikings. Violence was just a part of Viking and Nordic traditions, as were several blood sacrifices. Uh, on one hand, the Vikings had a soft side, believing in good luck charms, omens, and superstitions. Uh, their beliefs led to a great respect for the land, which some might argue led to their ample farming skills. I mean, these guys grew shit in Green Greenland, for God's sake. Most amazing Viking feat, in my opinion. Uh, they had more respect for women than the average European male. And they also had, yeah, these crazy rituals. Uh, there was like these cremations. After the death of a chieftain, a slave girl, this is so fucked up. A slave girl would quote unquote volunteer, doubt it, doubt it, as the chief's afterlife concubine. And then this ritual would include the slave girl having sex with every dude in the village before then being strangled and stabbed by the village matriarch. And then her body would then be cremated with the chief in a wooden ship. Wow, not fun. Not a fun way to spend your final minutes on earth. Jesus. Norse folklore also includes uh, spirits of the dead and undead creatures uh, such as revenants, a uh, visible ghost or animated corpse that is believed to have revived from death to haunt the living, right? A Viking zombie. That'd be a weird zombie. Wow, I wonder how, how would it talk instead of like, brains, need brains. It'd be like, oh, hey, oh, hey. Who needs your brains? Oh, please oh, give me your brains. I won't eat them. <laughs> Not that scary. Let's make it a little more fun. That was Viking zombie. Uh, supposed sighting of a revenant was usually interpreted as a sign that additional family members would die. The sagas would tell of, a, of drastic precautions being taken after a revenant had appeared. The dead person had to die anew and a stake would be put through the corpse or its head might be cut off in order to stop the deceased from finding its way back to the living. Oh, these people had some intense death rituals, weird shit. Um, now let's talk about that blood eagle. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I've mentioned it here and there. Let's get, let's really get right into it. After a word, after a word from today's final sponsor. Uh, Time Suck is brought to you today by Woody's Spirit Supplies and more Spectral Emporium. Uh, today you can you can save fifty percent off of any and all. Um, just uh, ah, sh ah, shit. <sighs> You can't, you can't, you can't do that. You can't, you can't get 50% off anything. They're, uh, listen, listen, you guys, uh, this is a little more heartfelt. There's, they're, uh, Woody, Woody's not selling any new spirit supplies this week. Listen, Charles Gutman, uh, just begged me to, to help him and Woody out, out this week. Woody, as you kind of know, hasn't been doing real well lately. And, uh, uh, recently he got blackout drunk and he, and he passed out in a ditch a few weeks ago. And laying there in the ditch, in the, in the in the moisture and the cold, and just being outside, he he somehow uh, contracted termites, and they've made it to his brain, and it's pretty bad. Uh, luckily, uh, you can help Woody out by by picking by picking up a Time Suck Woody T-shirt this week. Uh, it's so good. It it may be my new favorite. Yes, Woody tees for real are in the Time Suck store now, thanks to Access Apparel. They're printed on Bella Brand 5050 Cotton Poly Blend tees on either Heather Gray. Heather red or purple going with three colors to give you guys more options. Woody, Woody's very thankful for any of you who want to help him. Wee! I like all those colors. I've seen demons of all those colors sneak into people's private holes while they sleep at night. And usually, you should maybe buy me a drink sometime and talk about it or maybe get some of my paranormal rape repellent. No, Woody, we're already raising money for you. You, you greedy son of a bitch. Gotta get your shit together. 
Woody's new teas are made out of 200% ectoplasm, 300% demonic doll skin washed in holy water, cleansed by a New Orleans voodoo priestess to hopefully keep the shirt's evil energy from seeping into your meat sack soul. No guarantees on possession. But if you do become possessed while wearing a Woody shirt, well, Woody and his handler, Charles Gutman, they can just exercise you for, you know, another small fee. Supply and demand. I create the demand and I have the supply. It don't get much better than that. Wee! Uh, all proceeds, 100% of the proceeds go to covering uh, Woody's uh, carpentry bills. Okay, now for the Blood Eagle. Now I'm done with that. Now for the Blood Eagle. Uh, a new listener, Woody is a fictitious character from the Suckverse. That has nothing to do with Vikings. If you're like, what the fuck does Woody have to do with Vikings? Nothing. Uh, a Blood Eagle has everything to do with the Vikings, though. This shit is brutal. I mentioned it earlier with old Ivor the Boneless. Uh, of course, the experts argue whether or not this even happened. I hope it did not. If it did happen, first, a man would be uh, tied up. Then, the out- to hold him down real tight, then the outline of a bird with open wings would be carved into his back with a knife. A little pain warm up for what's to come. The tortured guy's back is then opened up, uh, like his skin peeled open. Each rib broken one by one in a fashion that makes the ribs stick out of the poor bastard's back. Uh, m- making his back look kind of wing-like, if you will. Uh, the person, possibly still alive, if this is true, possibly conscious somehow for all of this. I, I don't see how, but that's what the legends say. Next, actual salt is poured into the wounds as if it's not fucking brutal enough. And then last, last act, the lungs are fucking pulled out through the gaping hole in this son of a bitch's back. And then the victim's last breath is said to make these this shaped rib ornament fucking thing coming out of the tube's back flutter. That's right. Little little lung flutter for a little payoff at the end. And it, and it's said in the sagas there was always an audience for this. Just just writing that is pretty fucking brutal. And if it's true, what are you supposed to do at the end? Uh, are you supposed to cheer for the flutter? A little hip, hip, hooray, bravo. Well done. Uh, do, do you clap at the flutter? Uh, do you boo? If the guy dies too soon or the guy performing the ritual doesn't get the flutter quite right, you know? Some old cranky Viking who's seen some better, you know, blood eagles done. He's not happy about it. Boo! Do over. We came to watch a blood eagle, not a blood slug or a blood possum or whatever this horseshit was. He died before you even touched his lungs, Sven. I told you guys. Did I not tell you? Did I not say Sven is going to fuck up the blood eagle? I knew it. I knew it. He's never gotten one right. When I was young, when I was a young man, I got the flutter every time. I took the flutter seriously. Kids today, they just don't work like we did in my day. They're too busy raping and pillaging and berserking to put a little goddamn energy into putting on a good a blood eagle a show. <laughs> <laughs> there are many other rituals and ritualized practices uh, like carving. Now, I don't know about passed out there at the end. It's hard to breathe when you're trying to do a fucking weird old Swedish dude talking about blood eagles. Um, they did other weird stuff like carving and painting one's teeth. Uh, what? Why would you do that? Warriors and even slave warriors are said to have done this with their teeth. Archaeologists have found samples. I've seen pictures of these carved teeth and Nordic mummies. Sadly, they're not, they're not like uh, carved into like a little vampire pointy shape. That'd make the berserkers even that much more terrifying. Uh, there were many rituals for battle, uh, many ornaments worn for courage and luck and strength. But my favorite ritualized Viking tradition is the touchwood Viking fire pee. I told you in the intro, Vikings figured out how to set their piss on fire. Uh, n- uh, now, sadly, it wasn't it wasn't on fire right from the hose. Uh, but they used to collect decayed wood called touchwood, boil it over for several days in urine. After the boiling process was over, they would then pound this material into something similar to felt. The Vikings then, uh, they realized that, that, that urine, the sodium nitrate found in urine caused the, caused the tinder to smolder and not to burn. And then this would be a, a way they could somehow carry fire with them for later usage, even on their boats, right? Like, like, the, like, uh, kind of like an ancient super gross Zippo lighter, like a, like a status symbol, I guess. Like you weren't a young, hip, cool Viking unless you had some, some fire putty, some, some piss fire putty in your little wool trouser pocket. Um, after all the killing, the, the blood eagle and the piss bombs, I think it's time to lighten up the mood of touch. How about checking in on, uh, uh, you know, some, some, uh, recreation that the Vikings participated in. Vikings had both indoor and outdoor sports. Uh, the outdoor sports included wrestling, ball games, games featuring animal skin tossing, uh, horse fights, 
weightlifting, stone throwing. They had some sort of a, a balls out tug of war and keep away game where, where people died. Uh, the Viking uh, idea of swimming seemed to be seeing how long uh, they, could, they could drown a guy. Uh, the losers didn't get trophies. Their idea of baseball included a bat and a ball, but was a, a full a full contact sport as well called uh, Kratlik. Nobody knows the rules, but we're pretty sure people got killed. Um, Vikings also loved to ski. These are fucking brutal people. Um, skiing was like the, one of the least brutal things they did. They're actually given credit by many for inventing uh, modern Western uh, the modern Western form of skiing, but don't but don't tell that to Russians or the Chinese who were probably using skis. Uh, much further back into history than the Vikings were. Uh, Vikings loved skiing so much, two of their most powerful gods, uh, Ur and uh, Skadi, uh, were the god and goddess of skiing. They had a number of indoor games. Board games were apparently popular. Even uh, uh, some form of, of chess may have made its way back from Constantinople. Um, some of the Viking indoor games were drinking games that would lead, uh, of course, uh, you know, to fights and death a lot of times. The main drink of the Viking was a, was a honey and water-based alcohol called mead, although they also drank beer and occasionally wine. Mead was easy to make, flavored with raisins, fruits, and other botanicals. That sounds like tasty-ass mead. Uh, the fermenta- uh, fermentation process was still misunderstood, though, um, and, and deemed mystical by the Vikings, so much so that the stirring spoon used in the process of making mead, uh, which was never replaced and would get caked with yeast, was considered a magical item that was valuable enough to pass down through the family after death. Don't touch the magic spoon. That's how we make our mead. Um, These family heirlooms help preserve yeast strains that are most likely uh, uh, still alive and available today for your for your brewing pleasure. Um, Now for a few words on sagas. There are several surviving sagas and historical records written with a couple uh, within a couple hundred years of of the events that that, that, when they actually happened. Again, the author is both known and unknown. And like we said before, most come from uh, oral tradition or found on the runes. Um, of the sagas, I've chosen just a few to help really illustrate the, the minds and beliefs of the Vikings. I've avoided the Nordic gods since we've uh, already discussed them at length and the Nordic gods suck, but uh, this jaunt into the sagas, we'll, we'll have to kind of mention them. Get ready for an orgy of mispronunciations. Uh, one of the most famous and important ancient Nordic sagas is the Ragnarok saga. Ragnarok means fate of the gods, and the saga told of a series of events that would lead to major changes, including the death of the gods Odin, Thor, Tyr, uh, Freyr, uh, Himdal and Loki. It also contained the great flood legend where natural disasters covered the globe in water, similar to other flood uh, myths in, in other religions. Also similar to uh, uh, the Bible in the sense that uh, cataclysmic events and the world was being reborn. The earth was said to be repopulated by two humans. Uh, the Ragnarok saga made popular in the 19th century by the works of Richard uh, Wagner, more recently in Hollywood with the Thor Avenger movies. Uh, the inspiration for J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, his famous Lord of the Rings stories, is probably the is the Curse of Andvari's Ring. Uh, the Curse of Andvari's Ring appears in two Nordic legends that are bound by the magic ring. Called this uh, Antva, Antvaranot, uh, the story follows a dwarf named Antvari who lives under a waterfall and who can turn into a fish. That sounds fun. Uh, he owns the magical ring, which uh, has made him rich and powerful. The dwarf is later caught by the god Loki in a magic net. Loki tries to get the shape-shifting dwarf to give up his gold and his ring, and Vari puts a curse on the gold, but the ring is never found. Similar to how Lord of the Rings resonates today, the story of Envardi's ring was a popular story in the Viking times as it was carved into many standing stones. Uh, Thor, as you probably know from at least the Marvel stories, we talked about him in the Norse God Suck, uh, him and his magic hammer. Uh, yeah, he had that magic hammer, named it uh, Mjolnir. In the perpetual war between the gods and the giants, Thor was king of the giant slain, known as the defender of both the gods and the humans, and it was a big deal when his hammer went missing. Thor soon uh, learns it was taken by one of the gods. He kept smashing. The giant in question, a giant king, wanted Freyr to marry him. In the saga, despite the taboo of cross-dressing in the Viking world, Thor dressed as Freyr and traveled to the creatively named giant land. Thor, dressed as Lady Freyr, takes part in the wedding ceremony, and when the time is right, reclaims his hammer and kills a giant with one heavy smash. Um, and we talked about that uh, tale, and again, the Norse gods suck, but, you know, Thor's so popular now. Nice to throw it in here as well. Um, the legend of Odin and the runes is another important Scandinavian legend. Odin was the most powerful of the gods, considered the god of war, wisdom, death, and fate. When things were going bad, especially in times of war, sacrifices of animals and sometimes even people would be made to honor Odin. Humans were extra frightened by Odin because legends claimed he would disguise himself as a human and interact with human affairs, including tipping the balance of battles. The story of Odin's runes is told in first person by Odin himself in the Havmal poem called The Sayings of the High One, written down in the ninth century. Basically, in the poem, Odin talks of sacrificing himself to himself. 
Uh, for nine nights, Odin hangs by a tree upside down. And during this time, he receives a vision of the language of rune symbols and gives them to the Nordic people. Yeah, their legend's fucking so weird. Uh, there's only a few more of these myths and legends I want to touch on. One of my favorites involves a Viking lawyer. All of the Viking sagas show the complex laws of governance of even the most ancient Nordic tribes. The legal procedures of these societies were important, if not ultimately bloody and horrific. Supposedly, somewhere in the late 10th century, the Njal's saga takes place. The Icelandic lawyer Njal was petitioning for monetary settlements to end the problem with blood feuds. The idea of paying fines or compensating financially for wrongdoings to others was relatively unheard of, especially to the Norse. Njal's efforts couldn't even save his wife, sons, and his best friend from losing their lives to the madness of blood feuds. And even he would be burned alive in his own home in an act of revenge because of, you guessed it, a blood feud. Really just a lot of fun bedtime stories for kids. Hey, kids, what do you want to hear tonight? You want to hear about this guy uh, having his whole fucking family burned and killed and then him dying? Uh, do you want to hear about this guy uh, dying? Do you want to hear about these people beating the shit of each other and killing each other? <laughs> it's very violent, all these. Uh, the second to last of my chosen Viking sagas is the very uh, story that inspired Shakespeare's Hamlet. Hamlet? God dang it, I got fucking all these languages in my head. Weird pronunciations. Hamlet, uh, even, <laughs> even down to the letter uh, old Billy Shakespeare used. It's called the Omelet Saga, and just like Hamlet, it features Omelet's uncle killing his father and marrying his mother. The story doesn't have a love interest like Hamlet. Like Hamlet, uh, I want to see Hamlet because of my hing da um, But there's plenty of madness and conspiracy. Final saga I'm going to cover in this episode is about Volmund or Volund the Smith. This heroic myth feels like something straight out of a fairy tale written by Clive Barker. Volund, the hero of the story, is a goldsmith specializing in golden rings. He meets a talking swan, as one does who is really a shape-shifting uh, Valkyrie uh, with a little spunk, falls in love with her, briefly marries her. After a short period of marriage, the Valkyrie goes back to her duties, bringing lost souls from the battlefield to the Great Hall on the other side. In Valen's grief over the loss of his mystical wife, he is abducted by an enemy king. He is swiftly imprisoned on an island for not marrying the kidnapper king's daughter. Valen gets his uh, revenge by killing the king's sons, fashioning their body parts into jewelry, as one does. Uh, his revenge is complete when he shows the king what he has done. Just, do, you, do, you like my, do you like my necklace? It's made out of the bones of your children. Uh, in the final act, Valen uh, forges some apparently magic golden wings and flies away in search uh, of his lost ghost wife. <laughs> Another Scandinavian tale not in the Nordic sagas is Beowulf. The 3100-line poem written by an unknown author in Old English features a Nordic hero who defeated several monsters and is believed to be representative of real people. If you remember back to the Knut the Great, it was probably under that time that this work was commissioned. The only known copy resides in the British Library in London. Now that we've come uh, out of the other side of the Nordic sagas, let us look at how the descendants of Vikings live today and look at how popular Viking culture still is revered today. Uh, Viking um, culture and universally known in the United States, Vikings are consistently amongst the top 15 or 20 sports mascot choices. At least on the list I saw, uh, that ranked, ranked higher than pirates, bears, and hawks. Uh, the history of Vikings, currently the subject of the popular TV show on the History Channel called The Vikings, or called Vikings. Uh, I probably should have watched some of it. Uh, I haven't. You know, I'm not a huge fan of a lot of the History Channel stuff, but I've heard this place is great, or this show, excuse me, is great. And I have downloaded episodes onto my phone. Uh, movies like Snow White, The Avengers, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, even Harry Potter, directly related to Nordic tales in some way or another. In Harry Potter, the werewolf uh, Fenrir Greyback and the Death Eater uh, Thor Finrol, Nordic mystics. Thor is featured in Hitchhiker as a prominent character. Snow White, an adaptation of the old Norse story of Freyr and her experience with dwarves. Even the Jim Carrey movie The Mask and what equals uh, and whatever equals in cartoons it painfully uh, 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 produced afterwards was related to the folklore of the sagas. The mask Jim Carrey's character wore in the movie said to be Loki's. Uh, if you just look around, we're surrounded by Viking shit, man. Video games like uh, World of Warcraft, Age of Empires, Dark Souls, countless others, even fucking Tomb Raider, uh, and, and Halo, influenced by the legends of the Vikings. And there's another game here, but I don't, I'm going to embarrass myself. I don't know how to pronounce it. Joe, if you're listening, Skyrim or Skyrim? Skyrim. Okay, I was nervous, but <laughs> I play it all the time. I played it like 17 hours yesterday. Um, but yeah, based on uh, Viking stuff, Legos made in Viking land. Uh, Legos, you know, not invented in Viking times, but Sweet Lucifina, created in Scandinavia. Rock bands, pop artists who dedicate their music to Viking lore. Um, from Man of War to Jethro Tull to Led Zeppelin's Immigrant Song, you know, and, and Pops Quiet or Fawn. The Viking traditions live in lyrics and attitudes of many modern artists. 
Uh, modern artists like the previously mentioned J.R.R. Uh, Token, J.K. Rowling, uh, not alone in pulling from the Nordic sagas to help tell incredible stories. Michael Crichton's book, Eaters of the Dead, about Viking legends, turned into the Antonio Banderas movie, The 13th Warrior. So many Viking references, I couldn't help myself, but compile as many as I could just to see uh, the impact that society that's been gone for a thousand years has made. Few groups have made the same impact in the Western world, right? Even uh, the Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! card games have links to the Vikings. Uh, tons of others like Dungeons and Dragons, it's everywhere. Comic books, TV series, kid shows like He-Man and big budget animations like How to Train Your Dragon 1 and 2. Vikings are even prominently viewed by fans of the United States' most profitable professional sports organization, the NFL. Uh, the Minnesota Vikings of the National Football League rack up huge profits. Um, yeah, long ships featured at the stadium as well as other Viking swag and icons. Yeah, Viking culture very much still known and celebrated. Uh, the Western world remembers the Vikings so well that we border on uh, a kind of obsession with them. But how did the Scandinavian world turn out? Uh, how did they evolve from being uh, the Vikings in the past? Well, Norway struck oil, literally. Uh, petroleum reserves and other natural resources have made it one of the wealthiest nations on Earth. Over 27 million people live in modern Scandinavia. The largest city is Stockholm in Sweden with 1.5 million people, followed by Copenhagen. Uh, in Denmark, with nearly 1.3 million people. Oslo, the capital of Norway, about 1 million Norwegians. Denmark, home of the happiest people in the world, according to several studies. Their people also eat the most pasta per capita of any people in the world, uh, which to some extent, carbs equal happiness, at least in the uh, short run. Um, in, in one study I found, Denmark ranked third in quality of life. Uh, rankings based on recent uh, U.S. news statistics. Sweden, number two. Norway, number four. The big three, all in the top five. When nations are ranked by average household income, Norway comes in number two, Sweden and Denmark in the top five still there as well. Uh, interestingly, though, the Scandinavian nations are also ranked highest in tax rates and expenditure on government services. Uh, is this atoning for the berserkers and the raids, uh, the slavery and the colonization? No, it's just, uh, it's just Vikings doing what they do best, right? Just survive the best they can. Uh, and they are crushing it. Iceland, for some reason, was not one of the 80 nations assessed by this particular uh, study. Um, guess who's number one on this happiness scale, uh, by the way? It's uh, Greenland. <laughs> yeah, fucking Greenland. Uh, no, no, it's not even on the list. Uh, the, the U.S. is number 17. Uh, Canada's number one. Yeah, go Canada. I know we got a lot of Canadian suckers. Good for you guys. Number one. Uh, those early Viking settlers probably have something to do with that. You know, maybe. they plant, Maybe they planted some seeds of uh, happiness in Newfoundland. Uh, Poland, number four, for those of you curious. Uh, on another site, the WHR, the World Happiness Report that lists all the world's nations, uh, Norway, number two, Denmark, number three, Iceland, number four, Sweden, number nine, all in the top 10, Finland, actually, number one, you know, that nation that was conquered and ran by the Vikings for a time. U.S. is number 18 on that list, Poland, number 42, 156 nations on the list, Greenland does not show the fuck up. Uh, Syria is 150, Burundi is 156. Maybe Greenland doesn't show up because technically it's not an independent nation. It's, it, it's a constituent country of the kingdom of Denmark. Or maybe, this is what I think, I think maybe it's not on the list because maybe literally not one person living there is happy. Even people living in Syria are thinking, I mean, yeah, shit's terrible here, but at least, you know, at least it's not fucking Greenland. Maybe that's what they say every morning when they wake up. At least it's not fucking Greenland. Uh, the Scandinavian nations are small compared to many others in the world around them, but Nordic nations have several of the world's most profitable corporations and or most recognizable names. Equinor, a Norwegian multinational energy uh, company. Volvo, H&M, popular retail company that Queen of the Suck, Lindsay, and Momo love. The iconic IKEA that has profits of nearly $5 billion a year and some of the best cheap meatballs in America. Love IKEA. Suck dungeon covered with IKEA furniture. Sitting in an IKEA seat right now. Uh, the, uh, my equipment on an Ikea table right now. Oh my God. Love it. Love their gravy and their sweet lingonberry juice. Loving their lingonberry juices. Uh, Sweden has the 21st largest economy in the world. has less, uh, people than Los Angeles. Norway and Denmark have the 27th and 34th largest economies respectively. And both nations have populations about the size of Chicago. Not bad. Descendants of Vikings. Not bad. Things are going very well in the land of the Vikings. So there you go. The Vikings. A topic harder to explore than, say, the Romans, because there isn't the same amount of written history. Uh, a lot of the written history has been written by their enemies, and they and they also just uh, didn't have the same type of uniform empire. They, they were much less unified, you know, more of a collection of smaller clans, kind of groups who banded together here and there to go loot and settle uh, occasionally. Uh, were they barbaric? Yeah. Uh, more barbaric than their historical counterparts? No, I don't think so, actually. 
The Berserker thing is fucking weird for sure, but is it any weirder than the Spanish Inquisition or the Crusades or than what Vlad the Impaler was doing in Wallachia or weirder than what the Ottomans were doing to their enemies or what the Mongols were doing to theirs? I don't think so. Uh, stranger in some ways, I guess, but really, I mean, God, a lot of those other people did some horrific shit as well that we've talked about. I hope you enjoyed learning a little about the people we, uh, we still like to talk about or at least parody uh, uh, today. You wonderfully curious meat sacks. Uh, we do love the Vikings culturally. Okay, now let's review a couple of key points about them and bring up a new one, a fun new Nordic fact in today's top five takeaways. No idiots of the internet today again, I know, but it will be back next week for the moon landing conspiracy. Oh, oh, it's going to be back big time for that. Now time for today's uh, top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, the Viking era, defined as lasting from 793 CE to 1066 CE, beginning on June 8th, 793, with a Viking raid on a monastery on the holy land of uh, Lindisfarne off the northeast coast of England. Uh, and then ending in 1066, when William the Conqueror, William Duke of Normandy, is able to fight off Viking forces consistently in England after his rival for the throne, uh, Harold Godwinson, killed the last great Viking king in England, uh, Harald Hardrada of Norway, at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Number two, berserkers are real, or were, and they were real intense. A lot of today's association with Vikings being barbarians come from some Vikings being berserkers. Naked or semi-naked dudes, possibly drunk or high, taking in a ritualized bloodlust, attacking their enemies and sometimes each other in a manic state of savagery. Uh, number three, perhaps the main reason we see Vikings as being so historically savage is that a lot of their records were written by the people they were attacking. And maybe also because they attacked a lot of people's churches and also because of the whole uh, blood eagle uh, ho horrible nightmare. Number four, the two most famous Vikings are a father-son combo, Eric the Red, and Leif Erikson in 982 CE, Eric the Red discovered Greenland, founded a settlement in a place Siberians probably make fun of roughly uh, three years later. And then around 1000 CE, his son Leif in all likelihood made it to the New World roughly five full centuries before Columbus, arriving in present day Newfoundland and calling it Vinland or Vineland. Uh, number five, new info. Uh, okay, uh, no discussion of Viking culture would be complete without mentioning the Nordic belief in strange Dungeons and Dragons type creatures. An article published by National Geographic just over a year ago, not like a thousand years ago, reveals that 54% of Icelanders uh, either believe in elves and other magical creatures such as trolls or say it's at least possible that they exist. Actual roads built by the Icelandic government have been diverted around boulders where the elves uh, supposedly reside. <laughs> a former member of parliament swears that uh, his life was saved in a car accident uh, by a family of elves. No shit. Uh, the holidays are an especially fortuitous time uh, of year to see elves on Christmas and New Year's Eve. They're known to be on the move, searching for new homes. Uh, in 2014, Icelandic people actually protested the construction of a new road because it would disturb the homes of some fairies. Uh, residents of Denmark, Sweden, and Norway hold similar views about mystical creatures. So thankfully, no more berserkers, but the descendants of the Vikings uh, still believing in some, uh, some interesting things. Still a colorful bunch, still uh, still loving to talk about them. And that's all for today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Vikings have been sucked. Heep, heep, uh, Blood Eagle. Not going to forget that term or description anytime soon. Um, uh, big thanks to the Time Suck team. Thanks to Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins, High Priest of the Suck, Harmony Bellacamp, Jesse Guardian of G Grammar Dobner, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, Time Suck High Priest Alex Dugan, the guys at Bit Elixir, Danger Brain, Axes Apparel. Thanks to Heather Knowledge Ninja uh, Rylander for kicking off the research this week. Huge thanks to new full time Suck Dungeon employee Zach Flannery for his immense help on this one again. Love having him here. Uh, let's take a, a sneak peek at next week now. Uh, on the next episode of The Suck, we are treading where, uh, well, uh, several credulous uh, nudniks have gone before the moon landing. Going to look into how we land on the moon and look into those who think it's all a big hoax. Did we land on the moon way back in 1969? Of course we did. Uh, there are so many crazy theories uh, uh, and totally debunked reasons for being skeptical of the moon landing that the whole Time Sucks research staff has had a, has a huge sci-fi boner over this topic. It's going to be an epic one. We're looking forward to, to doing here. Uh, what are the smoking guns of this hoax? Uh, there aren't any, but we will be delving into all the most popular and credit. I did. I almost say credible. Uh, 
Uh, we're going to be looking at all the claims, and they are numerous. Uh, and so uh, this is a need, this topic of a good hard suck. From skepticism over the waving flag, the lack of computing power technology at the time, the strange movements of the astronauts and moon video footage, even claims that some of the lunar pictures have astronauts with staples in their feet. Uh, yeah. What? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, one of the theories is that the Disney company used models for the astronauts and forgot to edit out the staples. So many juicy conspiracies in this one amazing topic. So join us uh, next Monday as we look at how uh, we really did get, get, get to the moon uh, so we can determine once and for all, you know, if that big fucking rock orbiting our bigger, soggier rock, uh, you know, was hollow or not. And was it made of cheese? Let's, let's find out. Uh, I'm hoping it was, it's made of cheddar. Uh, Hail Nimrod. Okay, time now for today's Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker Updates. First message comes in from Time Sucker Nathaniel, who lets us know that getting sponsors helps spread the suck in ways I had never thought of. He writes, Dear Sir Master Suckington of Suckitude, I am writing you today simply to express the joy that the marvelous sucking has brought to me uh, in my day to day. I drive a box truck around Metro Atlanta, filling vending machines, so needless to say, I spend most of my days in and out of break rooms. And since becoming a sucker, I've spent the majority of that time making a fool of myself. In every way possible, from uncontrollable and seemingly out of nowhere laughing my ass off to mimicking Chikatilo impressions or singing some Triple M along with you when you McDonald us, and occasionally letting out a super fucking sick air banjo solo. Just wanted to say during one of my sucking fits in a break room, uh, this break room happened to be at an Amerigas facility. Some of the employees started laughing at me. So I paused the episode and said, what is big deal? And one of them looked back at me, looked me in the eyes and said, go jerk a soft shame cock in woods. I instantly knew I was in good company. He then revealed to me that during the weeks they sponsored the suck, their supervisor allowed them to enjoy a long lunch and enjoy the suck every Monday. <laughs> That's awesome. Just want to let you know how, how the uh, suck was spread through a sponsor down to their workers on the ground level. Just love how much the suck has impacted so many people, even those forced to listen to the suck at work. Hail Nimrod, and may the suck forever be strong. Oh, yes. Long live the suck, Nathaniel. I love this. Thanks to uh, any Amerigas employees still listening. What's this big deal? I hope you like it with Amerigas. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, time sucker Caden Fitzpatrick lets me know that uh, some of my merch is spreading the suck, also in unexpected ways, writing, Dan, you bearded beauty. I was at work, and I'm wearing your Flat Earth Tour shirt. And a guy asked me what it uh, said, and I told him, and then another jumped in and was like, oh, Dan Cummins? Yeah, isn't he the guy who came up with the Flat Earth Society? <laughs> I let him know that it's a comedy tour where you make fun of Flat Earthers. He seemed amused, so I told him about Time Suck and how you have the edits of the internet, and he liked that very much. Needless to say, he should be checking it out soon. You know what? I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it, Caden. I love that your coworker thought I was the founder of the Flat Earth Society. Uh, I hope more people think that. Listen to the Flat Earth uh, Suck, and then hopefully change their minds. Uh, a bit of encouragement coming in from sucker Gwen Lake after my rant last week about listeners who wish I stopped trying, trying to be funny here on The Suck. Gwen writes, dude, I had to pause the Napoleon episode to tell you, please keep being funny. I think you're hilarious. Please do not take the comedy out of the episodes. Your unique characters, tricks, and jokes are why I listen. Keep on keeping on. Hail Nimrod. Well, hail Nimrod to you, Gwen. Thank you very much. And then we'll end on, uh, uh, or actually, we got uh, two more. Two more ones. Uh, this is the second to last thought-provoking email from Time Sucker Tori Lou Hemphill, who writes, Can we encourage people to stop using the term minorities to refer to people? Can we use the term non-white instead? The population of non-white in the United States is growing and is almost equal to the population of white folks. The population of white people in all the world is eclipsed by non-white residents. Continuing to use the term is archaic. I also feel it encourages the belief that non-white people are less than, and we don't need that association. Hail Nimrod. Well, hail Nimrod to you, Tori. I, I like what you bring up. But I'm not sure non-white is the answer because that term still divides us along racial lines. I don't like the division within us meat sacks. Uh, all white races on one side, all non-white races on the other. And, you know, and it's just getting harder and harder thanks to, uh, you know, uh, breeding around the world with uh, different races of people to determine what exactly is white, what exactly is non-white. Easy maybe to identify in some cases, uh, definitely not in others. I think identifying someone by the race when you know it can be super helpful to let someone else, for example, know who you're talking about can be helpful. You know, like a, like if I'm pointing across a crowded room, there's only one Caucasian looking dude and a whole bunch of African-American, Hispanic, and Asian people. Easiest way to let somebody know who I'm talking about is to be like, hey, you see that white guy right there? Bam, done, over, moving on. But when possible, I I'm trying to not identify by race. That's, that's why I like saying meat sack. I like to try to reinforce that we're all on the same team, the human team. But I also see what you're saying. 
term minority doesn't make mathematical sense. Uh, it, can, it can sound uh, like inferior. That's insulting. Uh, don't know what to change it to. I don't like uh, non-white and white, but I like that you uh, gave us some semantic food for thought. And finally, going to end on a nice positive note here. Time sucker Bethany Prater sends in a little message to one community standing up successfully to the hate former suck subject the Westboro Baptist Church brings, writing, uh, hey, Dan, this is a flyer from the WBC. And I'm going to pull up this flyer uh, to uh, show here. So this flyer, it just says a bunch of horrible, hateful shit. God hates America is killing our troops in his wrath. Military funerals have become pagan orgies of idolatrous blasphemy where they pray to the dunghill gods of Sodom and play taps to a fallen fool. Thank God for IEDs and a whole bunch of other inflammatory, anti-troop, super hateful shit. Well, then uh, Bethany writes, Shasta County found out about this in advance. This protest is going to happen. And enjoy. Uh, and enough people showed up to line the street on both sides for over a mile, starting at the church. A minimum of three people deep stepped in front of the WC, uh, WBC protesters before the hearse passed by so that they were not even seen. I've never been more proud of my community for coming together like this. That's awesome, Bethany. Hail Nimrod. I love it. Completely shut those hate mongers down. And the community was brought together in the process. You know, uh, the WBC brought hate and they left that community with, uh, you know, more love than when they showed up and unintentionally brought some love. I love how those people twisted it around and I like ending today's Time Sucker updates on a positive note. Hail Nimrod. Thanks, Time Suckers. I needed that. We all did. Have a great week, everybody. Don't rape or pillage or blood eagle anyone. Don't move to Greenland. If you do move to Greenland, please write and tell me if it's as terrible as I think it is. Hail Nimrod and keep on sucking. <laughs> Mouse fighting so hard the whole episode not to do more Swedish air band show. Just uh ring the ding the ding but ting to ting it ting 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 ping to ping to plink to pink the tink the piddly tink for tink to tunk the tink 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 the tink look at the tink tink to tink diddly tink pink to tink timber tunk the tink tink each of my meatballs tink the tink